Brad Shaw. I will be Brad Shaw. Shut up, Jerry. He is the Chickasaw native and Chickasaw Hall of Fame, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we have got a treat today. It's taken it's months in the work. He's a Cauliflower Hour Lifetime Club member, Mid-Atlantic Hall of Heroes, Smoky Mountain Hall of Fame member, held a million titles, bodybuilding drag racing he's done it all but most importantly it's taken us months to get him on that tells you how important he is he is mr les thornton welcome to the show les, les, les thornton. Thornton. Bad, bad. <laughs> hey look right up behind his shoulder <laughs> holy shit john <laughs> les thornton. Hey, les, it's just great to have you out of the grave my friend good to see you i, I can't my english accent is not there but well, that's what happened when you passed away at all the young force. Yeah, Gavina, I'll try my best. You want to do this again, John? I thought, damn, John's giving me a great inter intro, but he gave Les Thornton a great intro. Les Thornton was a great worker, yeah. too. Not as good yeah, as he, 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 he's, been, he's been studying your bio. He's been studying Les Thornton's bio. He don't know shit about you, Les. <laughs> Wait a minute. I had all that stuff right. Every bit of it. You had it all right. Yes, you did. Yes. <laughs> well, shut up, Jerry. Les Thatcher's I can't talk. help it. It's late, man. It's almost my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. know, I, know, I don't know how many times I've had people send emails up you know, they confuse Thornton and Thatcher. And they'll say, we saw you defend the junior heavyweight title, such and such a place. Of course, I never was that place, right? <laughs> but yeah, so John made a legitimate call. Oh, no, no, fuck Thank him. You. Hey, <laughs> he, he's stupid. He's a damn Texas. <laughs> that was not nice at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we rolling or what? We're rolling. I'm not editing none of that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Les Thornton, man, I appreciate you giving me the Les Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I had to come up drama to you in front of Les Thatcher. Now, you remember that Les Thatcher, don't you, Les? Yeah, I've met him. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, John, you know, we got this guy here that's that's uh, that's gracious enough after two months of finally coming on our deal because he didn't know how to push a little butt down there where it said oh, microphone. I'm gonna kiss the only, only, the only guy I've ever we've ever had on that's older than me, older than water. That's less Thatcher, <laughs> not less sort. <laughs> but anyway, let let John. You didn't know less uh, less Thatcher career he spent. Dick Cut only did WWE champ. All these world famous greats: Dick Cutting, a Luthez, a Pat O'Connor, Jack Briscoe, Ric Flair, all the way up to uh, to uh, Terry Funk, and even Abraham Lincoln was thrown in there at one time. So. Oh, yeah, Lincoln was stiff. <laughs> well, see, you told me that before. Tell us a little bit about what you were training Abe, but when he was going up against Douglas. <laughs> Abe was tough to get behind. He was, well, he's he so was, damn tall, he should have been easy. Well, he's built a little bit like Hajo, that lean muscle, right? He's, that lean and mean muscle, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But was he as honest as he said he was, or what did he do? Uh, not the truth quite. He was a politician. <laughs> well, that says it all right there. John, John lives up there amongst those guys, so. Well, he'll probably go through his off that we're not the politicians. Enough. Oh my but God. Les, thank you. What, what an illustrious career. And I've been fortunate to know you on a lot of that career there. I think I first met you back in the 70s. Uh, 71. In Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina, there, right? Yeah, I, I met both the Briscoes uh, in 71. I went to, uh, went to Tampa, and that's where I met Jack. And then it came to Charlotte, and that's where you and I hooked up in 71. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that was quite an experience. That was my really my first territory. I think I just left uh, uh, Jim Barnett's Australian tour at the time. I'd spent a, a year over there and come in. Sandy Scott were there. They teamed me up with Sandy Scott to teach me the business a little bit. And what a teacher Sandy was. I know you sat under that tree with Sandy also. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What a great, great guy. Yeah, he, he helped me a lot. I first met them when I uh, got a contract in 62 with uh, Barnett. In Indianapolis, and that's where I first met George and Sandy. And uh, he was always, well, I'll tell you the truth. The first time I went to Charlotte was 63, and I checked in at the uh, the hotel, and the desk clerk said, Sandy Scott left his phone number, wants you to call him. And so I did, and he said, 
uh, I got your bookings. Meet me at the, uh, explain to me where the office was. Meet me there tomorrow. I'll introduce you to the, uh, to the boss. And uh, you're riding with George and I on Tuesday to Raleigh, come out to the, uh, my place and have dinner. So he took care of me, man. I, you know, couldn't ask for anything better. It goes, it, it goes back to, I want to ask you a lot about, you know, back right when you were started, but you said you signed your first contract 61 with Jim Barnett. Now, was that what he had his? Uh, 62. 62. I, is that yeah, what he had? I broke, the old TVs? I uh, he had Indianapolis TV. Indianapolis. Who who was he partnered with? That? Who was it? Uh, Doyle, Johnny Doyle in Detroit. Johnny Doyle, uh, yeah. yeah, John and I have talked a lot about these old time promoters there. You can really fill in a lot of gaps for us here. Well, just ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know, everybody does Barnett's voice. Everybody. Well, that's where the name Thatcher came from. You know, can you see the poster? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's reason I'm shocked that John introduced you as Thornton because I was looking at your name right there. And we appreciate you putting your name up because John Daddy has that old timer disease that you can't really remember a lot of this stuff. Well, you know, Milady's Irish. And yeah. so when I broke in in Boston, that's a big Irish influx. So, you know, Santos never thought about changing my name. And, and it, but people always, Milady is the way it's pronounced, but I, Malady, Malady, it, it gets butchered all the time. So, when I came to Indianapolis in 62, uh, that they started by calling me by my real last name. And then I guess maybe five, six weeks after I'd been there, uh, when it was a TV, Les Ruffin came in and said, the old man's tired of the ring announcers and the uh, guys butchering your, your last name. He wants to call you Les Thatcher. Is that okay? Hell, man, I was just getting started to business. Call me anything you want. Just let me in the ring. Jeff okay. book me right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's when I became Les Thatcher back in 1962 yeah. and been Les. Well, well, let's back up a little bit before that. Uh, you, you were, you were uh, Cincinnati, uh, a homegrown guy, right? Or uh, Ohio, a homegrown guy. And you, but yes, you sir. ended up out, out in the Northeast getting trained by Tony Santos, who I'd really want you to talk about. Uh, uh, tell us a lot about Tony, because what an interesting time that was for, for wrestling there. But uh you know, what, 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 what kind of led you to make a big ass move? And back in those days, the stagecoach days, that was a long move from Cincinnati. <laughs> 22 hours on a Greyhound bus, brother. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it, well, here's the thing. See, I wanted, I wanted to be a professional wrestler. And of course, why, why, why do I do want to be a professional wrestler? What, well, what I fell in love with it when I was about nine years old. I saw the first time I saw wrestling, it was from the old uh, music hall in Cincinnati on Friday night. And uh, we went, we didn't have a TV at home right at that point in time. We went to a neighbor's house and I first, first saw wrestling on a black well, and that, white. That was when TVs were first invented anyway, right? So well, a, lot, yeah, a lot of people yes, did that. I mean, on, honestly, that, I mean, I would, I go back to that time too, where a maybe one, 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 one person in a whole neighborhood would, would have a TV. Yeah, yeah. It was a black and white 10 inch screen, but it was like Don Eagle and Ivan Rasputin mm -hmm. and, uh, Guys like, and then of course, back then you got to realize once we got a TV through the week, Cincinnati had wrestling, get Dayton TV, uh, Sunnyside Gardens in Chicago, uh, St. Nicholas Arena in New York, uh, Hollywood Legion Stadium in LA, and Texas style yeah. wrestling on the kinescope. Yeah, Texas style wrestling, wrestling yeah. every damn night almost, you know, and i but of course, how do you get in this business? You talk to people and they say, uh, well, finally, when I was, I was 18, I decided I was going to drive up to Reynoldsburg, Ohio, which is where Al Heft had his office. And it, back when I was a kid, Heft was the biggest promoter in the NWA. They right. were promoting Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, Indiana, and Kentucky. Did, did they, are they, has anyone that started at DeMont TV uh, wrestling? No, that was uh, Fred Kohler. That had to yeah yeah uh so anyway uh so i drove up to reynoldsburg and uh went in and like a dumbass right not knowing and say i want to be a professional wrestler right now you were you, you wasn't into bodybuilding or anything like that at no, time, not at that you? time no you were, you were just a very a athletic baseball, football man. basketball all the whole whole nine yards and so uh frankie taliber who i didn't know i didn't know what a booker was for christ's sake uh -huh. but taliber i'd seen wrestle right and so uh, he came out to talk to me really nice about it. 
and well, you need to put on some size. I was probably 175 pounds at the time and needed to get experience. And of course, I was being gentleman. I said, I wanted to say, how do I get any experience? Nobody will let me do anything, right? So I was frustrated by it, but I picked up a copy of uh, Wrestling Review Magazine. And here was a story about Tony Santos, an in, a promoter in Boston, who actually it was the first wrestling school. Uh, he's, it, it, the story is about how he gives young aspiring athletes that want to be in wrestling a, sh a shot at being a TV star, traveling the world and all that stuff, right? Uh -huh. So I wrote him a letter. Realize it's 1959, uh, 60, right? And, uh, and so people said, wrote handwritten letters back in those days. Yes, yes, I could actually write <laughs> <laughs> and spell. It's clever. <laughs> yes. But anyway, so he sent me back a trifold about his school, which I still have, by the way. Oh, but wow. uh, so he told me the deal. So $300 for six months. And so I had, you know, saved up my money, got on a Greyhound bus in February, 1960, went to Boston and ended up in a little rooming house. And that's where my training started. Now that was, was that the time Patterson or he had already left or? No, or Patterson was... didn't come in until 61. So he was later than you then. Uh, yeah, but he had been, he broke in in uh, Montreal. Yeah, but now when I just this past year, I I went on uh, Peacock to look. I wanted to see the Pat Patterson uh, documentary that right. WWE did, and the opening is Pat standing in front of seventy two Westland Avenue. That's where we lived in the yeah. 80s. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Pat, Alex Medina, uh, Don Kindred, Black Magic, myself, uh, Ronnie Dupree, a kid named Johnny Mann. Uh, a kid from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, named uh, Jimmy Thomas. They called him uh, uh, Flash Thomas. But yeah, everybody lived in this rooming house at 72 Westland Avenue. It was right across the street from where Santos's gym was at the time. And so I, I trained. I started my training in February, and I had my first match July the fourth, 1960. And what I say to the young young kids, I said, you know, so I trained like six months. I said, you know, when they smarten me up. When? <laughs> July the 4th, 1960. Oh, wow. Yeah, honest. The first couple of weeks, I thought, if my dad were to pull up here while I'm walking back to that $10 a week rooming house, I might get in that car and go back to Cincinnati. <laughs> my, ass, like that. <laughs> my ass was handed to me a few times, right? And, and I mean, nobody really broke, but they'd, but, you know, they'd let you know you, they were there and that they were better than you are and all that. But uh, it was... It was fun too. I mean, it really was. And uh, now the crazy thing is I'm living in a rooming house with guys who are already working in the business, but they don't, they don't talk in front of me. They're not smart. They don't smart me up. But that 4th of July, uh, Tony, one of Tony's kids came over and uh, knocked on my door and he said, my dad wants to see you. It's like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I must be in trouble, right? It's 4th of July. We're not training. And the, the old man wants to see me. So I got dressed and went over and uh, he said, uh, you've got your, you've got trunks and Alma, Alma Mills, uh, Tiny Mills' niece uh, worked in the, the office for Tony and she wrestled too, but she made my jackets for me. And so he said, you got jackets, you got your boots, you got tights, yeah, trunks, yes. Okay, today's your, today's your day. Go back to your place, pack your bag, come back, we'll talk. Now, how they taught us to work without telling us it was a work was kind of unique because I mean they'd get in and hook you and you know and, and let you like I say they make you feel them but then they'd say okay uh, you and Gerald we want you to have a match but nobody's getting paid and it don't need it matter not about winner or loser we just want to see if you can make the switches from hold to hold but don't apply any pressure because you know it's not serious so they're actually teaching us to work a hold without telling us this is what it's going to be so Tony he says to me, sitting across from him at his desk, you remember how you trained and how we have you show you those holes, but didn't have you put the pressure on? I said, yes, sir. Well, that's what you're going to do today, which didn't really explain anything to me, but okay, I want to do anything, right? So we were at Blue Hills, Maine at the fairgrounds, 4th of July celebration. The ring was set up on the racetrack at the fairgrounds. 
but I rode there. They picked me up, Ron, Cowboy Ronnie Hill, uh, a local guy who played football at, at Boston University named Joe Sasso, and Bull Montana, who was a hell of an old heel. And, and I, I bought tickets to watch Bull, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I worked for Bull. <clears throat> that was my second match, or my actually my first match. I worked twice that day. But I got more education from Boston to Blue Hills, Maine in the car, right? <laughs> They're filling my head with all this stuff. And so my first match was against Ronnie Hill in a single. Sasso worked with Bull in a single. And then Sasso and I came back against Bull and Ronnie uh, in a tag, right? That was the See, whole that, that, that's how those matches, there weren't a lot of guys on the car, but if you were in a tag match, you had to watch what they call a warm-up match back yes. then, which is usually a 10, 15-minute uh, uh, when you tell way. these, yeah, when you tell these kids today, four guys put in put a two hour show on, they look at you like you must be nuts, <laughs> right? But that's the way, yeah. You're all well, spot shows, a lot of spot, yeah. you must have worked some spot shows like that too, right? Yeah. But yeah, so uh, that was, and my first shower was a damn garden hose out behind <laughs> the, the timing tower. Welcome to yeah. professional wrestling, yeah. right? Twelve bucks was my first payoff. Twelve bucks, wow. Yep. You still got that 12 bucks? <laughs> no, I, I spent it probably the next day. So. Get it but yeah, that's it. how it all started. And uh, it just, you know, it, it was, I look back at it. It was so much fun too, because once I broke in, all these guys are helping me. I've got extra trainers living in the same building I'm in, right? And of course, they're telling me, do this, do that, try this, try that. And so it was, I, I don't think there's a better place to learn th than doing it that way on it, quite honestly. And uh, well, probably th what, maybe four months into my career, we were in some small town in New England. I don't remember what the building was or the town, but anyway, the main event hadn't showed up. They had car problems or something, right? So they had called the building and, and they got the promoter. And anyway, so somebody's got to fill time. So Ronnie Dupree says, I'll take less and we'll fill the time. Give me the high sign when the, the main event gets to the building. He took me out there and we went 40 minutes. And I had only been, I'd been working less than six, six months at the time. Wow. But we, he talked me through every, every step of the way. Right. So that talk about an education. I mean, you know, and, and then uh, I, so I worked there. I, I got to work with Pat. Pat's, I don't start to say Pat's crazy. I don't want to tell you that. You know, Pat's no. crazy. Right? <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah. Uh, but then I, I came home for Christmas, went back up there, and then left there in November of 61 and came home. And, and actually, I'd met Emile Dupree in, in Boston. He'd work, come down and work for Tony out of uh, the Maritimes. And so he was working for Barnett and I saw he was at Cincinnati Gardens. So I went over and said, Hey man, I'd like to get my foot in the door here. So he gave me Les Ruffin's name and the address in Indianapolis. And I sent him uh, a picture and, you know, some background. And so he called me and he said, first thing he asked me, are you, how old are you? I said, I'm 21. You got proof? Because I looked, you know, <laughs> I did, right. And I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, need to be at Indianapolis television on Saturday. So this, I'd never been on a TV in my life before. Was the age because you were going on TV, you think? Or what, what was the age? Uh, well, because I looked younger, I yeah. think. Because, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, Rocky McGuire, that was Book of Mobile back in 67. Uh, Bobby Shane was the teenage sensation in Atlanta. Leo was really pushing him, right? 17. Right. So... When I when Kirby and Hall and I went into Mobile from uh, Louisiana, uh, Rocky said, "I'm going to put them together as a team." We were working as cousins, right? The three of us. But you're going to be my teenage sensation. I said, "What?" Uh -huh. He said, "You're going to be my Bobby Shane." I said, "I thought he's out of his friggin' mind." Uh -huh. I was 26 years old. He passed, <laughs> me, he passed me off and said, and the people bought it, and man, it killed my social life. Uh, how bad. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Hall and I were sharing an apartment and Kirby, the three of us traveled together and everything, but I couldn't go in a bar with them. I'm 17 years old, right? Uh, I couldn't date, uh, right? Because 
15 year old girl saying, can I have your autograph right? I'm like, Bryce, this is, this is crazy. But that moved me, that moved me to Tampa because they were doing a tag team tournament in Dothan, Alabama. So Lester Welsh and Eddie Graham and Sam Stebo came in for the tag tournament. And I guess because both of us are named Les, they teamed me with Lester, you know? And then Saturday, they were there for a Saturday night spot show. And so at, in the dressing room at, at the spot show, Eddie and Lester approached me and said, we've talked to Rocky McGuire and we want you in Tampa. You're, you're the NWA rookie of the year. And I'm <laughs> thinking, whoa, <laughs> this, now I'll be honest with you. Tampa had a reputation, right? I mean, yeah. wrestlers territory, as much as I want to go there, if somebody said, have you sent a resume there? Have you called there? At this point, I would have said no, because I don't think I'm ready for that. But there's the boss telling me I'm coming to, maybe I'm going to Tampa, right? As fast as you go. Yes. And so that's, you know, the first time I'd ever been down there in, in, in 67. And uh, my first, I got in, checked in the motel on Sunday. And so I picked up a Tampa paper and it's got the card in it. And my opponent, my first opponent is Don Curtis. Wow. And I, that's what I said. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I'd never met him, but I see his picture on the cover of wrestling magazines and I knew his reputation. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> right. But I'll tell you what, we became instant. That Tuesday night, I'm sitting in the armory. And I don't know if John knows, but we dressed upstairs in the, uh, the old uh, Fort Hesterly Armory. So the heels of baby face could all get together in the back. So I'm sitting back there and I see Curtis come in and talking to Eddie and Eddie pointed towards me. And so he comes back and he entered, he said, uh, I'm Don Curtis. And I said, yes, sir. I know. And I introduced myself. He said, we're working together tonight. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, is anybody sitting in this chair? I said, no. Mind if I sit down? I said, please. And I'll tell you the truth. By the time we went to the ring, we were good friends. Went out and had a hell of a match. And uh, I mean, and he and I remained friends till the day he passed. I mean, uh, I've got a, a brick from the old Jacksonville uh, Coliseum that he, he brought to me in Mobile at a reunion and signed it and said, uh, this brick from the, the Jacksonville Coliseum is stiff as my friend Les Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know better. <laughs> <I'm> done. <laughs> but, but yeah, so that was that was my first. And then the deal was that they decided that uh, Matsuda had just dropped the title back to Danny a couple months before that. So the deal was uh, that they told the story in programs and stuff that I was a big fan of Danny Hodge and that if I could get by Matsuda, then I got a shot at Hodge in the title, which led to Matsuda and Ronnie Garvin. They brought Kirby in and Kirby and I worked with... Uh, with them around the territory and uh it just never got to danny we we did get some heat though with a, with one of the top baby faces down there it's kind of funny sputnik and rocket i always got along with Sputty. first time i worked with him was in kansas city territory in 63 but this this day kirby and i are working with them on on tv and Sputty comes by and he says we want to get you guys over since you're just getting in here right and I mean, they won the match, but they healed to do that. And they put us over like a million bucks, right? So maybe a week later, we're, we're where we can talk to Spuddy. And he said, man, I, I'm happy I put you got, got you guys over, but it got me in trouble. I said, what are you talking about? Lothario <laughs> on in the office yeah. and said, damn Monroe's put them Kirby and Thatcher over better than they put us over, my God. <laughs> <laughs> politics really rare uh, well, back then back then or even politics oh there i've never been you know that's the one thing i'm not good at and don't want to ever be good at thank you very much i may not have done much or had much but it was on my merit it wasn't on my nose sticking up somebody's rear end that's for damn <laughs> but yeah so anyway then we went on to uh that was my first experience in tampa though but talking about 71 uh Jack, uh, I rode with him and Rue some, and uh, 
That's where I got hooked on Christofferson. Uh, yeah. Right. And a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> you were in Florida. <laughs> yes. With the Frisco. Yes. And then from well, there, and that was uh, in 71, uh, I guess Becker was crawling around uh, looking for a number two babyface team to, to be behind him and Weaver. And Lee, uh, Louis Tillette uh, recommended Danny Miller and I and called us said, yeah, you know, we both have been in the territory, had success there. So, yeah, OK. Uh, so that's when we came in and that's where I and I remember coming to your apartment. Uh, Paul Jones was over there yeah. with a couple of ladies. Oh, you should have seen uh, the bachelor pad. Oh, John, you he uh, George uh, George, what's it? Uh, Made you those lights? Who? Uh, uh man, I I don't I can't remember. Anyway, who it was. he had the he had four, these uh, long glass tube lights with a knob. They were disco lights, Les. They, well, anyway, he had four four <laughs> of them. Disco lights. Uh, yes, yeah, I did. Hanging over your apartment. At my apartment, they were the coolest thing in town. <laughs> they were synced with a stereo. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And I walked in that first night, and those that was the only lights that were on. And there was Gerald and, and uh, Jones huddled over there with their ladies. And I started sniffing around. <laughs> Boy, it smells funny in here. They didn't smell that bad, Les. Come on. <laughs> Wait a minute. You had your disco lights synced with your music? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they, like, pulsed with the music, Oh, right? yeah. They, they hung. They were uh, canted, right? Like they were hung in stair steps, all four different colors, and they flashed with the music. <laughs> well, he was a player. Well, like, was cold dude, but... <laughs> he was, was a player. <laughs> you still got well, you those should... disco lights, but... Mr. Briscoe? Do I, John? You still got those disco lights, Mr. Briscoe? I think I do up in, up in the shed, up in, up in front of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't get rid of those things for nothing, man. So, so no, what, somebody, was the, what was the bad smell? Uh, the women were probably the women uh, Paul Jones was with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? That just reminded me of the rib you, you and Jack pulled on PJ. And, oh, the, which one? The cat? Which rib? The Cadillac or, or, or the? Hit his suit? car. Oh yeah. Tell tell John that. that, that some of the well, ribs we Jones, Jones had been in Japan, right? And he's just came back, had a brand new Cadillac. Hell, it wasn't, didn't probably didn't have. He just bought it that day, I think, Les. Yeah. Huh? He just bought it that day. Was it that day? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, <coughs> Jerry and Jack, Jack is there. And Jerry and Jack, are, you were the guys who were down by the pool, the laundry room or yeah. something. Yeah. And yeah. Jones came back and pulled up in front of the apartment, but he left the car running. He ran in the house to get in the apartment to get something. So Jack was Jack went down and jumped in Paul's car and drove it out of sight. So, <laughs> drove it around the back of the building there where nobody yeah, can see. So it. Paul comes running out with a cigar stuck in his mouth and <laughs> where's my car? Right. Looking for those keys, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, he just bought a brand new, just slick Cadillac, man. Uh, dark blue. I mean, it was white, white top, and I, I wonder what right when they come out those cushion top, Landau he, top. He wanted yeah. to wanted to show us the Cadillac. So Jack and I were up over in a, in a pool house over there. We saw him run up the stairs, and Jack said, "Let's go get that car." So Jack runs out. He's a lot faster. He jumps in. He takes the car, and it's one of these big, huge apartment complexes. So he takes it way around the back. And, I, and as soon as the car disappears, I go down in the parking lot. Here comes Joe down, out out of the out of the parking lot. He got a cigar. He said, "Man, I want to show you my new Cadillac." So we take about four steps out in the parking lot. He goes out there. He's looking. Then he starts checking his pockets like this. <laughs> I mean, he's panicking. This is in a neighborhood that's not that great of a neighborhood <laughs> either, beside the apartment, you know. And oh shit, somebody stole my new car. And I'm doing everything I can to keep him laughing. About that time, Jack circled back around, you know, walking. 
and hey Paul, how you doing? Oh, I'm not good. I did you see my cat what kind of like, you know? And I mean, we we bleed him, bleed him fine, and we can't take it anymore. We just start bursting out laughing. He he, he never to beat the crap out of both of us. <laughs> you know, uh, he and Jones got an apart another apartment together over on the other side of town, and they had a three it was three bedroom, and the odd bedroom had a waterbed mattress with no frame. In other words, it covered the whole floor of that of that bedroom. If that tells you anything. go along with my, my lights, my sink lights. Right. Wait, wait lights. A minute. You had a waterbed mattress with no frame? With no frame, man. It yeah. prohibits the water from sloshing when you got that frame, man. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the the bed had to be huge. Yeah, when you you the frame. Good, man. it yeah. covered the whole floor of that in okay, one bedroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those cow kings before cow kings, Jay Belong job. <laughs> this guy, this guy owned a waterbed store and he'd make a special waterbed, so he made me an extra large waterbed that covered wall to wall, man. What'd you do for sheets? I just, I didn't use them back then. <laughs> <laughs> sheets, what do you need sheets for? <laughs> Well, what Plus, I didn't know you were going to tell everyone all this shit on me. You know? <laughs> well, I, I well, need to tell John the story about us going to the concert, too, Nona. Which one? <laughs> Which uh, the, uh, the Rod Stewart concert. <laughs> tell him, man. <laughs> Rod Stewart's going to be at Memorial State Outdoors, right? Outdoors uh, concert, Memorial Stadium on Saturday night. So, you know, I got tickets. We go. We're booked in Spartanburg, which is like 80 miles from Charlotte, right? On Saturday night. It's all right, no problem. We make it. He had a Mercedes Roadster at the time, right? So we get down to Saturday night. We're down in Spartanburg. I get my match over, get dressed, shower, dressed, ready to go. The minute he's out of the ring, shower, we jump in that Mercedes and we're up going up I-85. 100 miles an hour, right? We're going to make it. We're going to make that concert. We get off in Charlotte, and he's running through the streets at 65 and 70 miles an hour. We get to Memorial Stadium and can't find a place to park near the stadium. We had to park six blocks from the damn stadium. We're out, and we're running to get back to the stadium, right? We give our tickets. We get inside festival seating, so we're trying to work our way as close to the stage as we can. And finally, the MC comes on and says, and for his final song to Tonight, Rod Stewart's going to sing. So we did all this for one song. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> and there goes Jerry with his uh, Mork and Mindy uh, alien <laughs> internet going. I'm being adopted, guys. Help, help, help. Help, help, help. help. Uh, Talk about better. special effects. Joe, come and help me. <laughs> Now, now you guys are getting up in my in my picture up there. Uh, can we uh, can we get you to? All, do all I need now is my music lights going on to this thing. That's right. right. You need your uh, you need your disco bolts. Yeah. <laughs> Lord. All right. You want me to leave? Try to solve this too, problem? right? You gonna you blame this on me? Of course it is. It's uh, of course it is. Right. Is. Well, you guys go ahead. I'm on. I'm gonna try to do some men in there. Okay, you fix it and come back. Okay. <laughs> so, Les, when, when when you, that July 4th, sorry, sorry to skip way back, but that July 4th, when you have your first match you and they spark you up, did it surprise you? Did you, did you already know. figure oh. out that business was a work or did, was it? Yeah, because it, it, when I moved to Boston, I figured it was a shoot. Okay. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. Right? So, yeah, the fact that I found out that I didn't have to be bruised and battered all the time Thank you. it was a godsend but yeah the, the, like i say the surprise was the morning of july the fourth you know when my first match but nobody ever smartened us up till that time had, had you already kind of figured it out that it was well, this other a guy named billy graham that was his real name uh was trained at the same time and uh he said i think there's something to this and i said well i <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't uh, deny that. And so, anyway, he had a, 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 a like a, a 
gymnastic mat in his basement. He, he, was, uh, he was a black belt in uh, martial arts. But anyway, he and I taught each other to drop kick. I, I'd stand with my back to him on that mat, and he'd drop kick me in the back. And then he'd stand and I'd drop kick him in the back. And so we, you know, but here's the other thing too. Even if we thought that, we weren't going to open our mouths and say so. Because right. then somebody would have snatched you and said, let me show you. <laughs> right. Right. So, but yeah, it was, uh, well, you know, the kids today are, have got it easy to be quite honest. They, they, they do, you know, they, because, well, I think the hard part is to be a teacher today because they come in thinking they're smart to the business anyway. And I think a lot of them take it as, well, it's, it's all a show so I can be an actor. But of course, the three of us know that it's a business unto itself. There's nothing like it. And to learn to be a worker is a lot harder than just taking bumps. So Yeah, and one of the hard things I've seen, Les, is that, you know, when, when you came through the, the system where you worked a lot of different places, you know, which are not around right. anymore, you had to right. learn how, every different style. You had to learn how to get over a million different places. And by the time you get to something big, you've had a thousand or 2000 matches. Now they don't sure. have that educational background, which is a huge disadvantage to the guy. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. Well, you, you know, know, when I read that uh, WWE was going to stop taking in independent, independent guys and going to college guys as a trainer my first thought is it's not this is a numbers game anyway you can put a hundred great athletes in a gym we're not going to turn out a hundred great wrestlers we may not turn out three or four out of that hundred people right and so i don't care if they come from college or from the streets or where uh some of the best guys that i've well you you both know who nigel mcginnis is sure yeah well uh when he was the ring of honor world champion i so proud of him. i mean he's he started with me right uh so you you got guys like that but he came in with that same kind of fire that i had years before him right i mean the passion was there and i think today too many guys see it as a money grab right as hey there's big money in that wrestling business i want to get in it well i can even go back one you guys have both seen the naked cowboy right uh, yeah. that doesn't yeah. Times square sure okay he's a cincinnati boy and uh <clears throat> i i had uh judged him in a couple bodybuilding contests he was you know a teenage contest and so when i had my my place hwa in cincinnati he had called me and, and said can i come by i said sure so he came by and started talking like he wanted to get in the business and i said well bobby how long have you uh liked wrestling oh he said i don't like it but i see that hulk hogan got in the movies that way and i said my first bit of advice is i'm going to tell you don't ever say that to anybody but me <laughs> because i'm not going to bitch slap you but somebody will <laughs> i tell you, you want to get in the business to get in the movies right just use it as a stepping stone but i think a lot of guys take that you know with with Dwayne and and uh cena and those guys they see that and they think this, this is the way to, up there, right? Less, and, less to your point there, I, I, you know, I was scouting uh, college wrestlers for years and years, and I had two kids that I knew were great prospects, good looking, big, six foot three, six foot four, big, big old boys. And uh, they, they told me they wanted to use the wrestling business to get in the movie business. They wanted to be like rock. And I, I, I quit recruiting them because I, they, you don't have the passion for me. And so, I just no. totally quit recruiting them, so that I, I can back up what you're saying there. Yeah. Well, what, I'll tell you, when I did the the guest coaching job at uh, – we lost him, John. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I did the guest coaching a few years ago at the PC, uh, one of your guys – one of the guys that you had brought into the system trained with me the first day, and then I found out they let him go the next morning. And I, <laughs> but uh, that's – you're right. I don't, you know, I, I don't think people realize how, how good Rock and Cena are, were, and how right. long they had to work to make it in Hollywood. You know, I saw Rock, you know, Jerry did too. All of us did. You know, when, when he was 
had that loaded card in the late nineties and he would go out for 30 minutes and just cut a promo at the end of a show, at the end of a three hour show. And he keep everybody there. Sure. Hardly anybody in the world could do that. I mean, he, his talent is just immeasurable. Yes. Like Cena, it's immeasurable. And then they have a tough time transition. To, of course they both make it, but that's very rare that oh, somebody yeah. like that comes along and then ends up making it. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It, it's uh but I think a lot of kids look at it that way and they think they don't look at it as I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to get sore. It's a, it's a show. Right. And, you know, I, I think the people that broke in back when we did had the passion that Gerald, you know, and we both have talked about, uh, well, how many guys back from the sixties or seventies, if you talk to them, say, did you get in for the money? Hell no. I just love the business. I just wanted to be a wrestler. Right. You were, you know, as people talk about Marks, but we were Marks, right? I mean, we really were. I was a we fan. Were, we were the biggest ones, last because we bought at 100%. We, we found a way to get in because we were at Marks. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But, yeah, I, I think that's the difference today, too. But like we were talking before we started recording, before Gerald got the St. Vitus <laughs> dance. <again. laughs> Man, all we need is disco lights pulsing right now <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is senior abuse there's got to be some laws out there i can i can i can collect on i uh, hope there are <laughs> senior abuse here les where did you end up because i was always uh, i always loved going to the maritimes uh you know we did it every year uh you know go up there just for a couple tours but we didn't stay right when did, when did you end up in the maritimes uh 1970 that was for rudy k and the Corn cormier uh, he was a promoter, and uh, I was up there from April to mid-October. They, they ran a season. It was a lot of fun, man. It was uh, well, actually, it's also where I started doing broadcasting for the first time by accident, believe it or not. But uh, yeah, that was I love the, the country is so pretty up there. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. We used to always work, uh, you know, New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, go up to Newfoundland, and to work all the different uh, Moncton. Yeah all those different uh, uh, cities. And we always loved going up there. We just didn't stay long. You know, right. I always heard the territory up there. I was always thought I'd be great to work a summer up there. It must've been oh, a lot it was. of fun being up there. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, if you were a heel up there, it was a dangerous time. <laughs> the, the fans up there weren't, weren't bashful about what to confront the heels. And I, that's the only place I worked heel there for about six or seven weeks. They brought me in that way. And the funny thing was, in 1970, uh, you were an American over the age of 21. They called you a draft dodger anyway, if you happen to be in Canada, right? <laughs> right. So you became a heel automatically. You're an American, and you're not in the Army. Why the hell not? You're a draft dodger. So, yeah, that was the only place I ever worked heel. And when they finally turned me baby face, I said, thank God, because we, <laughs> I was traveling with Freddie Sweet Tan, Phil Robley and Stan Bashan. And uh, Lord, if Robley couldn't get you in trouble, you couldn't get in trouble. <laughs> Act two, right? we, <clears throat> there was there was a bar in uh, called the Truckers in Moncton, is where we were based. And the owner's son uh, worked some for Rudy, just doing jobs here and there, right? His local boy. So anyway, but we go there once in a while. So anyway, this one night, uh, there's uh, Robley, uh, Freddie, uh, Stan, and we had this little guy that played in the band that one of them knew with us. But anyway, so we're going to truckers after the matches. So I pull, pull up there and uh, they said, well, let us out and we'll go in. I, the parking lot looks pretty full. You got to find a place to park. I said, okay. So everybody jumped out and they went in the building. So finally I find a place to park in the back of the parking lot. And I, it's on a truckers on the second floor and I go up and I open the door and walk in and I see this body flying across in front of me. Right. And then I look and I see Stan headbutting some guy and then some jackass grabs me from behind and I, and I'm crashed back into the wall to free, get rid of him. And by this time, I thought, what the hell's going on? I just parked the car. And the owner comes and said, the cops are coming. You guys go to the third floor, meaning the wrestlers. So we go up to the third floor. 
he said, I'll, I'll, I'll come get you when the cops are gone. So apparently he'd run through this problem before. <laughs> so anyway, he comes up and tells us, you know, everybody's gone. Guys, go home. We come down. The parking lot is empty except for my car. And I had a, I had a brand new Pontiac Bonneville, right? I picked it up uh, from the dealer in Cincinnati on my way to Moncton. So I just had the miles on it coming up there. <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> we start walking toward the car. And we hear some, see headlights. There's two cars come pulling into the parking lot. And some boys come jumping out with tire irons and chains. And I thought, oh, my God. We, <laughs> we're going to die here in Moncton tonight. Right? <laughs> so we start backing up towards my car. And I'm telling these, I, I, I told the guys, not loud enough that the, the, the guys coming after us. I said, when we get close enough, I'm going to break for the car. I'm going to get it fired up. Your ass better be in it. Because I, I the, the numbers weren't right for us. This <laughs> Nobody was going to put us over that night. So anyway, uh, uh, and Robley is screaming, come on, mother, mother, come on. And I said, Buck, shut the fuck up, right? It's like, we don't need to prod the bull any further here. And talk about being saved by the The local police pulled in just before those guys got to it. They ran them on, right? And they said to us, said, you guys better get back to home. And of course, everybody in Monk knew us where we lived anyway. So I start, I start driving to go drop these guys off. We're about four blocks from the truckers. And Roby says, damn, left stop, pull over. I pulled over and I said, what, Phil? He said, we got to go back. I said, what? He said, we didn't get any beer. I said, if you want beer, <laughs> you can get out and walk back. I'm not going back there. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> so... But that was the kind of crap that went on with the heels in Moncton in 1970. Was so, it just all because you were heels? That, that's what started well, the whole fight? I don't know. Somebody could have, well, Robley never uh, saw a fight he didn't want to be a part of, I don't think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it was the fans there. Uh, well, uh, we, we had to, in uh, St. John's, if you were a heel, you pulled your car up to the back of the building and one of the St. John's policemen took the car and another cop followed him in a cruiser and they went and hid your car so that the fans couldn't destroy it. <laughs> That's how bad it was, right? The heels couldn't leave their cars in the parking lot. So was it, it was, a good territory as far as drawing money and, and getting paid? Oh yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was, and it, the trips weren't bad at all. We're in Moncton on Monday night, uh, Halifax Tuesday, Halifax TV Tuesday morning, uh, Wednesday morning, St. John's at night, Fredericton on Thursday, a spot show Friday, and some uh, sometimes spot show on Saturday. But they weren't bad trips at all, not at all. But yeah, it was. Uh, and like I say, that's where I first got a chance to do uh, do broadcasting, quite by accident, as a, as a matter of fact. Rudy and I had lived next door to each other in Charlotte, and we'd made a lot of trips together and everything. And just shooting the breeze and stuff. And I, uh, after I'd been to Tampa in '67, uh, Gordon and I got to be buddies. And I had, I'd said to Rudy, I guess, a couple of times, you know, maybe when I retire or something, I'd, I'd like to try that. Because back then, Gordon was the only probably decent broadcaster, <laughs> because a lot of the broadcasters were the the local kiddies show host who got an extra 25 bucks for coming in and putting wrestling over. And he spent more time putting himself over than he did the matches, you know, that sort of thing. And Gordon, when I saw him in Florida, I thought, Oh my God, he's selling the business. Like it's real, you know, and that's. Well, unless you think Gordon was one of the first that, that, that was a full-time wrestling guy. <clears throat> I, yeah, I think probably that's part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think so. I would think so. Um, but yeah, that's so Rudy knew that I wanted to give that a try. So uh, on, like I say, we went to Halifax on Tuesday, worked at the house show Tuesday night and TV Wednesday morning. He called me on Monday. I was just talking about different things. And he finally said, you know, you, you mentioned that you'd like to try to be a, a broadcaster sometime. I said, yeah. He said, well, be sure to bring a sport coat and, and a tie tomorrow to Moncton. And I said, why? I said, because you're going to do, you're going to be the uh, announcer on the show. 
and Rudy was well known for his ribs, right? And I'm thinking, uh, -huh, okay, I'm gonna bring dress clothes and walk into TV station. I get surprise, it's a rib, right? But finally, he convinced me to do that, so I did. And back then, there weren't two guys on the desk; you just one. And I'd been interviewed, but I'd never interviewed anybody. I'd never segued in or out of a segment. And I went in cold and we got, we got it, how we got it done, I don't know, but we did. And so I did the next couple of weeks. His, his announcer at, uh, was from Toronto and he had a death in the family. So he had to fly back to Toronto. So at first Rudy was just covering for him for a couple of weeks. But then after I'd done a couple of weeks, Rudy came, uh, called me and he said, you're doing a good job. I'm gonna leave him in Toronto and I'll work something out and give you extra to do TV as well as the deal we worked out for you to wrestle. I said, okay. So that's how it all started, just by accident, actually. How hard was it calling a show by yourself without, without anybody else? I know you've done both. What, what, how's the dynamic different? I, I prefer to bounce it off of somebody, you know, uh, to let me get a run and, and like pitch it to them and for them to come back. When I watch a particular show today and see four guys on the mic, I don't want to be a part of that because that's too, too many, I think. I mean, yeah. sometimes they have a heel sit in or something, but I prefer working with a partner, to be quite frank, because I think they, if they come from a little different direction than you do, right, they add a little uh, more depth to it sometimes. And, uh, but yeah, that was, I don't, that particular day, I don't know how I got by. I really don't, because I was nervous. I thought, what am I doing, right? But, but we got it done. So, but and I finished out the season uh, doing the TV there. So, and then, then after that, then you started doing commentary in most of the places that you were working. Well, I, actually, I just, when I came back to the States, I had been in Nashville and I went back there for a, a spell. And then I uh, uh, called Tampa and Leo said, sure, come on in and uh, just wrestle. But when I went back to, when, uh, Danny and I went to Charlotte in 71. Uh, I was in the office one day and Lord Littlebrook was in. And uh, he said to Mr. Crockett, this Jim Sr., uh, Mr. Crockett, why isn't Les on your TV? And Mr. Crockett looked at him. He said, well, Brooke, he is on my TV. No, no, no. He said, as an announcer. And Jim said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he did Rudy's TV last year and did a heck of a job. And Mr. Crockett looked at me and he said, you never told me. I said, well, I didn't know I was supposed to. I didn't know anything about it, right? So that's, so they, they actually tested me first. They sat me in with uh, Bob Cottle in, in Raleigh. And I remember coming off that trial and Gary Hart saying, you didn't put yourself over. And I said, that wasn't the reason I was out there, right? It wasn't about to get me over. It was about to get the match over. So then I started sitting in and uh, with Jim, with Jim, uh, Big Jim, uh, and oh, not what was what was the announcer Channel Three in Charlotte? Big Bill Ward. Bill Ward. I know it was. I say it, Big Jim, Big yeah, Big Bill Ward. I'd sit in with Bill. I sat in with Charlie Harville was the only one that gave me static in, in High Point. And the first point, after yeah. after the first show, sat in with him, and he, before I left the studio, he said. You know, Les, I'm not going to try to be a wrestler, and you don't need to try to be an announcer. Like, I guess he thought I was going to steal his spot. You know, and I thought, hey, I'm just, I'm just doing what I'm told. That's all. But uh, so then it finally worked in, and I, I, I did the B tape there, and then uh, started doing all the promos. And you were, you were also doing the magazines at that time. How did you? Well, get I, here, here's another thing that happened by accident. But yes, we got into the magazines. I was looking through some old uh, souvenir pro. Remember uh, the autograph books, right? Where they have your picture in a place for the fans to sign the autograph. And there was a couple of those laying on a file cabinet in Mr. Crockett's office. And I was looking through them. And I said, Mr. Crockett, I said, you don't do these anymore. And I, I don't know who it was, but he's told me this. Somebody who ever helped him with those before wasn't there any longer. And I said, oh, that's too bad. I said, he said, why don't you try it? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you do one. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, we got plenty of pictures and just put something together and show it to me. So that's how it all started. I did the first two were just autograph, you know, uh, uh, albums. And then we started with the 
and then they grew to the big color features and the uh, centerfold and the art rendering covers and nobody's ever done anything. That was one of my pioneer uh, approaches to the business. Nobody's done it since, quite frankly. And then that turned into, and, and uh, Jimmy came back from, an, uh, Jimmy Jr. came back from an NWA meeting and called me into his office and he said, I got a little, a little job for you. I said, okay, what's that? He said, to do an NWA magazine and every territory gets a page. Yeah, that's just a little job. What the hell? <laughs> right? And we did the only NWA. Now, NWA had a magazine out in the uh, 50s because I used to have a couple copies, but that went under. And so that, that magazine with Terry Funk on the cover uh, was the one and only NWA magazine, I guess. And that we put that out. It was in 75, 76 with Terry on the cover. So, but that's again, just, you know, uh, we did things with magazines that had never, the centerfold and the cover. Uh, we had uh, <clears throat> an artist at the, uh, the studios who did the magazine layouts. I give him, you know, like uh, with Greg Valentine, I always talk about the Valentine trophy case. Like when Greg was on the cover, we had a Valentine trophy case with all the trophies in it, right? And we did, we did a lot of great covers. Uh, if you go to uh, Mid-Atlantic Gateway the website, they've got a bunch of the magazine covers and, and the stories behind them on there too. But yeah, we did a lot of stuff, magazines that no other magazines had ever done and haven't done since. And then Vince saw them. And uh, this was when he was running up in New England. And uh, George Napolitano got in touch with me and said, Vince has seen those magazines and we'd like you to do some for WWWF. So I did five issues for Vince. It was in the late seventies but nobody's ever done anything like that since. How did the magazines do? Oh, they did well. They did well. I, I'll tell you, they do better now. I wish I had a few cases. I can sell them suckers for a hundred bucks a pop now. <laughs> and, and I remember uh, at the Briar Bend office, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Jr. coming back and saying, Les, if you're not busy, why don't you and Jackie go out in the warehouse and, and see them old magazines we haven't been able to sell and throw them out. Uh, and when I <laughs> and I thought I wish I had a few cases of them suckers right now, uh, but there there people don't uh, balk at all at paying that for them in, in good condition, obviously, right? But yeah, that's how big was your staff for the magazines? Me, <laughs> really? I, I I did the rough layouts. I uh, I wrote the stories uh, and Cal Byers uh, Studio who did the final layouts and, and the, his artist did the cover. Uh, I go in with them. I walked it through the whole thing. And uh, Francis, Jimmy's sister, uh, Francis Crockett helped me with it. And a uh, guy named Don Swafford, who was doing uh, PR for the office at that time, Swafford helped me with some, but basically I, you know, uh, Francis would help me get, get some ideas by Jimmy Jr that he didn't, you know, something that was maybe a little off the wall for the, that period of time. And I'd say to Francis, I don't know if Jimmy will buy this. She said, he'll buy it. <laughs> she said, I'll take it to him. <coughs> and, and he did, but yeah, that was, uh, they saw, I'll tell you a funny story about Jimmy Jr. and those magazines. Uh, we were in uh, Greensboro Coliseum and Sandy Scott and I were doing uh, broad casting from upstairs that I wasn't wrestling that night so I had jacket on and everything but anyway Jimmy and Jackie and I were standing out by where the ticket booths were to come into the Coliseum there in Greensboro and the, the new issue of the magazine was out and they had been laid on the little kiosk things that the, the vendors use right and so we're just standing there and the vendors aren't out yet but all of a sudden the gate opens and the people start coming in Jimmy looked around he said, we better go to work. And I didn't know what he meant at first. He walked up the closest kiosk, picked up magazines and started hawking. I said, okay, then we can all do that, can't we? <laughs> and wow. we did. Yeah. So, I, I, I always got along with Jimmy, but that solidified it for me that, you know, if he's willing to get, you know, get out there with the rest of us, hell, there's nothing that, that you can't do for somebody like that, I think. 
but that was a great place to work. I think Gerald will tell you that, wasn't it? Well, I loved working short. And, and, and both Crockett's, uh, there was no drop off when, uh, no. when Jim or when John Ringley took over from the old man and, and, and then from uh, Jimmy transferring uh, over from uh, Ringley. There, there was no drop off in the quality of management. And that's what made you feel good about that territory was just the right. quality of people that you were working for. And they were good old honest country people, John. They really were just old country sort oh, yeah. of folks. You're right. And it would get out, like I said, anything that you would do, one of the Crockett's would do too for to help you out. Yes, they, they, weren't, they weren't shy about it. Well, you know. I'll tell you, uh, in 72, I came down with hepatitis. And I was out for six, over six weeks. And uh, on Tuesday, Klondike Bill, or big boy Brown would come by and knock on my apartment door and hand me an envelope and said, Mr. Crockett said to bring this to you. Now this is back in 1972. It was $150 every week in that envelope. And then <clears throat> around Wednesday or Thursday, Mr. Crockett would call. How you doing, baby? You know, and I always felt that I needed to say, well, I'm, I hope to come back, you know, and, and he'd always say, no hurry, you get well, how the rent paid. Uh, I said, Jim, uh, BB brought the money by. No, no, that's grocery money. Your car payment made, your rent paid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And through that whole thing. And then uh, I came back. It was a week before Thanksgiving and I wasn't figured any angles or anything. And yet they gave me three of the big shows to make sure I had a good payday coming back off of being out six weeks. And that year for, went home for Christmas. I went in to get my last payoff and walked in the office, Mr. just Mr. Crockett and I. And I said, uh, Jim, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and to thank you so much for your help uh, earlier this year. He said, hey, baby, just do me a favor. Don't tell anybody and ruin my reputation. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned that Mercedes I was driving around and, and I, you know, I was, I was young in the business. I really had, didn't have any credit history. Jim Crockett Sr. had to co-sign for that that Mercedes. That Is guy. that right? And he called me and he, he said, I, you know, he said the Mercedes man the back, back, I think it was, called me and said, you, you, you wanted to buy a Mercedes. I said, yeah. And I said, I don't think I can afford it. He said, go down there and sign the papers. Everything's taken care of. Just make sure you make payments on time. And he, he just he, said, don't, he, buy, he, a, don't he, buy a home here. Yeah. Yeah. He <laughs> told me that too. <laughs> he told me that. I bought one there too. Damn I know. <laughs> you bought a couple. Yeah. How I many know. condos did you end up? Hey, I had a the, bunch of the big <laughs> entrepreneur was investing in condos. They're going to turn over and we'll make a lot of money. Now he's sitting with two condos and he's not living in either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Did Crockett co-sign on the disco lights? Uh, no, those were gifts, John. Come on now. I was over. I was over. You know, and I was over with the disco crowd. You know, I'd uh, <laughs> stand alive, stand alive. I can do all that stuff back in those days. I had bell bottom pants on. Just like Les did. Les and Les, I, I got to bring this up here. You and I did a venture together back in the early 70s before anybody in, in our business uh, ever did something like this, a merchandising business. You want to share that story with, with the sure. crowd? Sure. Yeah, it was, uh, well, you and I and Jack were at your place sharing a few things. <laughs> <This is> the <laughs> to the disco lights. <laughs> the disco lights, yeah, and that funny smell again. <laughs> that smell seems to be a, a, a it follows the discos around a lot. It does. <laughs> but yeah, we're just well, we're just we're just talking about things in general, right? And I I had mentioned to a couple promoters about well, this is 1972, and T-shirts caught fire in the late 60s, right? And every band and every everybody had a t-shirt for something and i had mentioned to a couple promoters that wrestling is time for them to do something like this in wrestling and they just nah they, they weren't interested and i mentioned this to, to jack and jerry and jack said well let's do it i said why he said well let's three of us do it we'll all throw in a third and we'll sell t-shirts and so uh that's what we did and Gerald and I, of course, you can there's all these mills around North Carolina, right? So it wasn't hard to find the shirts we found. A and so that, that third bedroom came in handy for this. <laughs> My bedroom, I'm the one who had to carry them all over the place. He, he wants some of the credit, but he's not going to 
You get it, John. <laughs> it wouldn't go in your bedroom, Jerry. You had a wall to wall water bed. <laughs> That's it, right. That was only a one one bedroom. But I, you know what? What I I was knowing I was going to do this with you guys. One of the things I think that we started was the merch table. Now, when I say that, the reason I'm saying that, John, is back then the only merch that anybody had in the business was black and white uh, eight by ten glossies. Right? You could get a hundred of those for ten bucks at Mass Photo Print in Houston, Texas. Right. And so Gerald and I, I don't know if he remembers this or not. The first night we had the shirts, we went to Fayetteville. And of course, you didn't need any place to lay eight by 10 glossies, right? You give them to some kid and they went out and hocked them. We needed some place to put the damn t shirts. So we had to get the uh, building maintenance people to get us a table. And we set that table up. And you know, they talk about things flying off the shelves. We sold the hell out of those shirts that first night. I mean, like crazy, right? And uh, they sold well. And then I started thinking, well, like we didn't take them to Norfolk because the scope wanted 40%. Right. And our markup, we were selling these shirts for $3.50 yeah. a piece, right? You could get them in any color as long as it was white. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jerry Lawler did the artwork yeah. for 25 bucks. <laughs> wow. I was, I wish we had that original artwork and be worth a little bit more. What was the original right. shirt? <laughs> what I was don't the original know. shirt? At Briscoe Booster. It was the yeah, picture of Jack and Booster. I. Briscoe Booster. Then, then a Thunderbolt shirt, which sold like hotcakes also. We had yeah. Didn't we have actually have Andre the Giant signed to, to, to do a shirt or something like that? We had Watts. Yeah, we had Watts. And Woods. Tim, Wood, Tim Woods. Yeah. I think we had Andre, too. I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, okay. I don't think so. Okay. But there's a picture floating around. Maybe that was when that smelly stuff was going around. <laughs> yeah. I just I thought that. <laughs> Maybe that was we, the bootleg we, shirt you had. Yeah. <laughs> I did a charity softball game in Mooresville with against the Mooresville firemen and policemen, right? And there's a picture floating around Facebook of Gerald and I. It was for a young man with a <clears throat> born with an open spine. And he was in like a, a, a glass deal that he they almost brought, like one of those iron lungs almost yeah yeah and there's a picture of gerald and i he's got a briscoe booster shirt on i've got a tp power thunderbolt shirt on standing you know with this uh, by this kid and in, in his uh iron lung or whatever it was yeah yeah we were, we were able to get bill after to put uh little little ads and all those wrestling mags so each wrestling mag we, we had an ad in all those mags and, and then and we got somebody uh, somebody well, named well, less traded out with uh, Norm Keetzer on his wrestling news, I'd write columns for him and in turn he'd run the ads. Right. But then where, where it started to get dicey, like I say, we didn't have that much of a profit built in. And now- uh, And we didn't have much experience either. No, we didn't. We were not <laughs> entrepreneurs. Well, we were all wrestling. That's all we really cared right. about. This yeah. was like an extra thing. But uh, Heb the Hebners knew somebody that was high up in the rich department stores in yeah. the Southeast. Right. And so they actually took a shirt. And there, now if we'd have got in there, we'd have been on the road yeah. to success, right? We'd have had to, we'd have had to have several thousand shirts printed right away, but they, they didn't take them. But then once and in the Tampa program, Jack, Jack got a right. in the Tampa program. I got at the time I, well, okay. We got to tell the story about me going to Atlanta to work with Gordon too. That, that has a Briscoe involved. The Briscoes are involved in my life. <laughs> I live my life for the Briscoes. Yeah. Me too, damn it. <laughs> Jack, Jack called me and he said, this is when they, him and Woods had bought into Atlanta. It's during the war, the uh, Gunkel versus the NWA. And he said, Gordon's flying in every, every week from uh, Tampa. And we want, to bring, we want you to come down and handle the TV. Uh, help with P, uh, public relations and the mag and the program in the office and wrestle. I said, you don't want me to do anything? I'm just going to sit around, right? <laughs> so anyway, I, I was interested, right? Especially to work with Gordon. That, that was, I was looking forward to that. So anyway, uh, Jack calls Jimmy Crockett. And Jimmy didn't want me to go. So Jack calls me. So I said, 
you know, I didn't want to rock the boat there either because like Jerry saying, great place to work. I had a great relationship with those people and I wasn't going to, didn't want to screw over or anything. So I didn't know what to do. So then Eddie calls me and he said, we got it figured out. He said, you give them your notice and tell them you're coming to Tampa to wrestle. On your way to Tampa, drop your furniture off in Atlanta. Right? <laughs> and you come down here and wrestle for a month and then you go back to Atlanta <laughs> and work in the office. And I'm thinking, oh, it'll work, but you don't think they'll figure out what the hell's going on here, right? It's not like this is going to be a big secret. But then Jimmy changes, I don't know how Jack got to change his mind. Jimmy changed his mind and said it was okay for me to go. So, and he's talking about the t-shirts. I rented a two bedroom apartment in Atlanta. One bedroom was for the t-shirts. <laughs> the other bedroom was for me to sleep in, right? But my, my dad took pity on me hauling those t-shirts all over the damn place. And we moved, uh, he built racks in the garage in the house in Cincinnati. And my mom and him took, uh, did the mail order from up there. So, because I think I can, and then when I went back to Charlotte, I had to haul them damn t-shirts back to Charlotte again, right? I think this is crazy, <laughs> but, how, but yeah. How good was the mail order business? Good. <laughs> it was good. It was good. But you know what? People, uh, the fans weren't, it was something new, right? These guys are selling t-shirts. What, what's that about, right? It was a whole new thing. How long did it take for promoters to start stealing your idea? Uh, oh, they, they well, want a piece of our cry, idea. Cry, cry, I think when we went to Virginia and we kept selling out a t-shirt every, every Friday night in, in Richmond, Virginia, and, uh, and a Coliseum was, was calling Crockett, hey, we need more t-shirts because they thought they had to go through Crockett's. And it was through us and the Crockett, finally Crockett came to, came to hey, sorry guys, you know, we're going to have to shut it down either. Well, yeah. Either give us a percentage of it or we're going to shut you down, basically. Barnett wanted a piece because he had the ad in Atlanta program. Yeah, everybody, everybody wanted, everybody that was helping us out all of a sudden saw dollar sign. <laughs> the <laughs> idea was <laughs> great when I presented it to them, but it was great after they saw it working. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I told Gerald a, a, a year or so ago, I said, you know what? We sh if we could just get one percent of the net of what t wrestling T-shirts sell for a year, we we could buy us a mansion in the Bermuda someplace, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my God, how many? If, if we could get, get in over there, somebody's got got a got a, a lock there with the government that will only allow so many wrestlers in there, and they're they get the quota. <laughs> That's exactly right. I got a Bermuda block in Bermuda. <laughs> A, a Briscoe, a Briscoe block in Bermuda. Oh, okay. I see. you got a place in Bermuda? I did. Well, yeah, I lived there for ten years. You were that wasn't a reference you was making, or you just pulled that out? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, I, that's I what happened. For, uh, I lived there for uh, ten years. Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, this made me think of it. Jack. Uh, we were standing. We we're at Raleigh TV. Jack and Jimmy Crockett uh, Jr. and I are standing talking. And this is before the Atlanta deal. But Jack said to Jimmy, he said, Les doing your TV and I've heard nothing but good. Jimmy said, yeah, he does a good job. Uh, but I just wish uh, he, my fans could identify with him more. And, and Jack said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, he wears a spread collar shirts and, and a chain. You know, back then, you know, the spread collars and, and everybody wore jewelry. And uh he said, I just like him to be able, the fans to be able to identify, identify with him better. And Jack said, well, hell, I just want your fans to identify with him, have him wear bibbed overalls. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny. Jimmy didn't think it was too funny. <laughs> let's, let's, let's jump, just jump over to when you were doing the commentary for, for Ronald Fuller up in, up in uh, his, his. I hear where I'm at system. now in Knoxville. Uh, where you're at now in Knoxville, you you were you were there when that Plan B came around, right? Uh, with, uh, with I've never seen it, Gerald, and I've never want seen to see it. it. You ought to, you ought to, you ought, really you ought to take a look at it. it. It'll it'll upset you, but you need to take a look at it. But did you did was there any inkling this was going on? And John and I's question is, how in the hell did it stay buried for this long? You know, well, it didn't. We Ron and I knew uh, several weeks before they split. Somebody, well, Ron, Ron called me, said, you need to come over here. We got, we got problems. So I went over to his place. 
And now this is when? Uh, tell us. This was, was timeline. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was before the split, right? Okay. There was no in, no indication of being a split at this point. But, but somebody in the group that was pulling out had talked to somebody else, and that somebody had buzzed Buddy Fuller, and Buddy buzzed Ronald. So Ronald said, Root, Orton, Malenko, et cetera, et cetera, these guys are pulling out, but we can't let them know we know. So we, you know, he's lining up guys to come in, of course, and, uh, uh, but we, we're, we're going on like, nothing's happened right and uh they were they were doing their little bit to to try and uh this is before they left to try and make our tv look like a car a cartoon too and the thing was when ron bought this they were doing that through their work or how were they doing it okay. yeah well they want to make uh jerry blackwell is going to be a bumblebee they want to dress him up like a bumblebee this and they did group, groups booking is what you're huh? Roof booking is what you prefer referring to. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, they, you know, but anyway, we just wrote it, wrote it out, right? And when they left, you know, but the thing of it was when they went into business here, all it did was kill the territory. In Atlanta, both offices, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. We would sell out the old auditorium on Friday night. Gunk would sell it out on Tuesday. We'd sell it out Friday, Gunk would sell it out Tuesday. But she just couldn't hang on because she couldn't replace talent that she was wearing out. And of course, you know, NWA was. But yeah, the, uh, the deal here. Were you guys aware of that video when they made it? I, no, I wasn't. No. No. I don't I, guess anybody, because Ron says he wasn't aware of it either. No. They, well, they did, they did silly nonsense too, like, take a deflated basketball like they're trying to dribble it, right? And, of course, they challenged the guys who they knew they could beat, mm -hmm. right? I'm pretty tough, too. <laughs> if, if I can pick the guys I'm going <laughs> to call out. But, well, I'll tell you how that went. You know, nobody called Tony Charles out. Nobody called Slater out, oh. right? Uh, but it came down to where there was almost Slater and Roop almost went at it. it uh, this bar that we uh, that lounge where both offices hung out, right? I, I tried to separate them and almost got nailed in the midst of this year, right? But uh, they they killed the business because they were spending more time making fun of southeastern wrestling than they were putting their own product over. Plus, this city is not big enough to divide like Atlanta is, right? right. You. Uh, some of the fans went with Garvin and, and Roop and those guys because they were fans of those guys. But And then Ronald sold to Barnett. And then Barnett sold to Crockett, Flair, and Mulligan. Mm -hmm. And I was witness to this. Uh, we were sitting in the dressing room, uh, Blackjack and Kevin Sullivan and myself and Mac McMurray, the referee, and Ed, uh, Ed Sanders, uh, Sandberg, I mean, ca uh, came in. Uh, he owned a uh, car wash and he was an ex uh, on the sheriff's department in Knox, Knox County, but he had worked security for Kazana and he worked security for Ron. So he just stayed on and helped security for everybody. But the boys had stopped by his car wash. They knew Ed liked to, to talk and gossip. So anyway, he comes in this night and I say Mulligan and uh, Sullivan and myself are sitting there. And he says to blackjack, he said, uh, Two of the other guy, uh, two of the guys showed up at my place. I said, and, and Jack said, yeah. He said, they said, well, I see we got new owners. I guess we need to uh, get to the challenges again. And before, uh, before Ed said, Jack said, stop right there. He said, you go back and you tell them that every dime I got is invested here. So don't waste your valuable television time challenging. Just tell me where you want me to be and when. And I don't need to tell you, nobody told him where to be or when. Right? <laughs> so that's, but they killed the, t they, they did. And, and this whole thing started over, Ron Wright was a hell of a heel here. I mean, right. he was. Uh, yeah, he Whitey was. Caldwell was my, my partner back in the 68, 69, and part of 70. We made nothing, we made, we drew a house in the rain outdoors. I swear, we did. 
and the outdoor, uh, the amphitheater at the park, uh, we still hold the attendance record. I mean, money, you know, prices go up, but nobody's out drawn. On, and that was in 1969, for Christ's sake. So the, ter I mean, and he was held, Ron was held heel, wasn't a great worker, but a hell of a talker and, and a meat chopper, you know, but he drew money. But then the more he, it, it, he thought East Tennessee belonged to him. So Fuller, uh, he wanted Johnson City or Kingsport or one of those to be his town, right? And Ron, I, I wasn't in on it, but whatever, they just didn't work it out. So that was the thing to start. But here's the cra crazy thing. Uh, Rook says, well, he skimmed off the top. Now, I never handled the money. I, I couldn't say, it. but I will say this. I'll say it now. And I, I said it to Ron. I've, to, I've told every, any, I'll tell anybody that listens. If he didn't skim off the top, then he deserves a humanitarian award because every other friggin' promoter in the business took the first cut off the top. Yeah, he'd and, been the first that did. Yeah. And Bob, you worked for the best at that in Tampa, did you not? <laughs> <laughs> How many guys are getting a piece of that action, right? right? Yeah. But and, and so it's a stupid reason for killing a territory, right? I mean, it, it was. And, how, how do you think that video stayed under underground for so long? Though? I don't know. I don't know. It, do you have any I, clue so, where it was or who, who brought it out from underground? I don't know. I, I would guess Bob or... or uh, well, Bob Bob swears he didn't do it. We no. had Bob on now. Yeah. Check in the mail. <laughs> Check in the mail. <laughs> I respect you in the morning. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I never heard about it until like in this last few years, right? Uh, and I, I, like I said, I, I don't want to say, and you're right, I'll get pissed. But I thought you guys would have killed your own business, right? They did. They did. They killed their own career. They could have killed their own careers. I mean, they were, uh, sure. Bob Orton Jr. was a young man at the time, a very yes. young, very young talent. Went on to be big, big, do big, big things. Uh, Ronnie Garvin went on to be NWA champ. I mean, they put so much in Rupe, you know, he went on to book more territories after that. So, you know, all, all of them, and Maliko, he, he was really the only one at the end of his career. Ron Wright, you know, he, he's Tennessee guy, and that was all he wanted. Yeah, he wasn't going anywhere anyway. Uh, that's all he wanted in life anyways was that. So it's, it's yeah. so weird. John and I both just, wow, wow how did this happen you know? Yeah, and I'm like you. They, if they'd have put that out to the public, they'd have killed their own careers, right? I mean, we we, we kind of suspect it was kind of aimed toward Barnett, uh, really, because they they really got into the homosexual things towards the end of it. Yeah, they, they said it's something about. I didn't see that part, but I'm guessing. Yeah, I. Uh, well, you know, the crazy thing is, I I felt bad about it too because uh, I was kind of Ron's lieutenant from the get-go here, right? I mean, right. we, we yeah. became, friends, became friends in Florida in 71 and the state in touch. And, and actually when uh, he bought this, he called me and he said, uh, I just bought the Knoxville territory. I know nothing about television. I want you to come in and build me a TV show. And so I did. And we talked about that too, because another place that the old man was a pioneer <laughs> was in television. But uh, yeah, I, I never... I don't, I don't know. It, it just, it was the craziest thing in the world that, that they thought that that was going to work. I, I just never, never figured that all out at all. We had but Ron yeah. Fuller on the list and uh, he was talking about his hockey team that he had in Nashville and stuff. What a great promoter. I mean, I, I just, yeah. what well, they, they, what they a, owned the uh, Cincinnati Cyclones too. When they, yeah. uh, Bob, Bob Polk, who's a local, well, Bob lives up in New England now is around, around his grandchildren. But Bob uh, was a local guy here. Ron and I made friends with when back in 74. And uh, he and Ron went on to, to do the hockey thing. But when they, Bob called me, this is after I moved back to Cincinnati, he called me and he said, I'm going to run something by you now. And I don't want you to let it out. I said, okay, what is it? He said, what would you think about Ron and I bringing uh, hockey to Cincinnati? I said, I think you're out of your friggin' mind is what I think. <laughs> They've had three teams die a horrible death right here in my lifetime, right? But they came in and promoted it like, you know, like wrestling, basically. And it drew, and it's, it's Cincinnati Cyclones. Now, Bob and, 
and Ron don't own it anymore, but their third partner has still got it and still doing business up there. Well, so their their franchise is still existing, the Cincinnati franchise that they originally bought. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It is. You're right. Yeah, but, I thought yeah. so much of it, Les, that uh, I sent the tape to some uh, uh, Major League Rugby owners. You know, they're the same type of thing, trying to create rugby in the States. I said, this has been done before. <laughs> I said, listen to Ron Fuller. I said, they all got right back to me. Go, that is amazing. He, you know, he's yeah. just so good. He, plus, he's a great storyteller. You know, just a oh, yeah. smart guy yeah. to listen to. Oh, yeah, he is. You're right. He, uh, <laughs> they, you know, to tell you a story about the first – they, they had a beauty contest, a bikini contest in the dead of winter on the ice, right? And just to have some, and he thought, he, he, he told me, he said, I thought we'd maybe get one or two women. He said, there were 20 some women showed up for this thing, right? And the, and the stands were filled, right? But it got over, you know, it's. Promotion, yeah, he, promotion, promotion. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Promotion, promotion, promotion. But that TV that I built here, talking about being a pioneer, uh, I had guys, we did things that had never been done on wrestling television before. Because he gave me carte blanche. He said, as long as it makes sense, let's do it. Okay. So we had split screen. We had instant replay. Nobody else was doing that. Uh, and I did a, put a thing together called personality profile which was a pre-taped five minute interview, low key talk. Like I say, if I've got Gerald on, Hey, let's talk about your college background, your hobbies. Uh, in other words, give us some depth, right? My point, and I'll tell you guys why I came up with this. It's we got all night, right? We're going to be here till midnight or something like that. Anyway. Uh, so. Well, something about NASCAR. If, if you're a fan of a particular driver, it's probably because you drive the same kind of car that he races, right? Yes, absolutely. Or if you're, you got, you follow football players from Oklahoma, he follows football players from Texas, or I mean, college ball players that go to the pros, right? There's an identification. And today wrestling should be doing the same thing and they're not smart enough to do it. And you can tell everybody you want that I said it if you want. But here's, here was my point. It, uh, back in 66, when I first went to, the first time I went to Atlanta, uh, the first day of, I was there for TV, Leo uh, said, you're not worked into anything right now, but I want, it, I want Ed to enter. Ed Capper was the announcer. I want Ed to interview you. And now is this drag racing stuff? Is that a shoot or is that just part of I said, yeah, because I, I was driving on drag strip when I was 15 years old. Before I had a driver's license, I was racing cars. And uh, so anyway, Ed asked me about that and talked about some of, some of the drag racers, those champions from Georgia area and that sort of thing. So then we're in Augusta the next week and this late elderly lady comes up to me and she, she said, my grandson would like your autograph. If you don't mind. I said, no, ma'am. So she, he gave me the, uh, the program and I've signed it. And I said, uh, do you come to bell auditorium with your grandmother all the time? And before he could open his mouth, she said, he's never been here before. She said, he comes over on Saturday night to watch you guys on TV. But until he heard you talking about hot rods, He'd never been here. Light bulb went off. I sold a wrestling ticket, not because of wrestling, because of drag racing, right? Okay. And then you guys are, you guys are both old enough to remember that there wasn't always four ex-football players doing anal uh, being analysts at, at halftime. They had to entertain. And they had done some personality stuff with football players, like a, 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 a defensive lineman, who did pottery as a hobby, right? Like the two sides of the coin sort of thing. And I thought, yeah, but you buy into that, right? Hey, that's my hobby. So now I'm a, a closer fan to this guy if I was a fan to begin with. So that was my point to get that across, right? And so, and to make my point to you guys, uh, one of the early personality profiles we did was me and Armstrong. And when we were uh, riding together sometimes in Atlanta, uh, we would play this. We both were into fifties doo wop music, right? And he'd name a song, and I'd have to name the, the artist. And, and he, I'd name a song, and he'd name, you know, until somebody lost, until somebody. So toward the end of our five minutes on here, I said, "You remember that game we used to play in the car with, about doo wop?" He said, "Yeah, you mean where I beat you all the time?" I said, "Well, I don't remember that, but let's see." So I threw a name of a song out. He gave me the artist. He threw a set, 
and I gave him the artist, wrapped the segment up, and went on, never thought any more about it. So that next Friday night at the Coliseum here, uh, this lady walks up to me and she said, you're, you're Mr. Thatcher? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm so-and-so, secretary to professor so-and-so who is head of, I forget, the history department at UT or, right, anyway, I'm a college professor. And he's big into doo-wop music. And he wondered if you and Mr. Armstrong were just making that up or whether you both actually were into it. I said, no, ma'am, we, we both are actually into it. She said, well, could you answer these? She handed me two self-addressed stamped envelopes with two typed question, pages of questions about doo-wop music that the professor wanted to see if we were smart enough to answer. <laughs> Make my point, right? We drew him. He might have been a fan before. He's a bigger fan now right? Because we have something in common. And that's what I, and I had people tell me that won't work. Why? Well, you're doing low key and you'll lose all your heat. Well, let's see. One of the guys that said that was Bastine. Red and I discussed this from Charlotte to Fayetteville, from Fayetteville back to Charlotte. And he was bound to, it wouldn't work. Dory came in as champion and got him on one of the profiles, right? So when he went to Frisco, I guess, He'd mentioned that to Roy and Red was out there helping with the booking. <clears throat> and so then Dory called, Junior called uh, Ron and said, can you guys send a copy of that personality profile out to Roy? They want to see it. So we cut, you know, dubbed, dubbed one of them off or a couple and sent them out there. And one day my phone rings and it's Red. He said, boy, do I owe you an apology? I said, for what? I said, what have you done? He said, the damn personality profile, it's really good. Would you mind if we use it? I said, no, I'd be proud to have you use it. <laughs> but yeah, and now everybody's doing low key sit down pro interviews, right? It's it's common now. It still works. That wouldn't said it wouldn't work in 1975, but by God, it's working today. <laughs> so, you know, I've given my I've given my blood sweat to this damn business. Plus, yeah, sure. half the, <laughs> plus half the things that are being done in the business today, I. I had a hand in inventing. So and plus you plus you you sacrifice your integrity to lay Abe Lincoln to break him in. I did. I, I absolutely did. Yeah. <laughs> How would disco lights fit in your personality profile? Huh? How would disco lights fit into your personality profile? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been great if they'd been popping behind. Hey, Les, did Bill Lapter put those in a wrestling magazine at one time and it sold more copies of Wrestling Review than any other issue ever, <laughs> yeah, ever it came is. out? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Ask after, he'll tell you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Bill, Bill will know. Won't he? <laughs> you know what, John? You and I, I was thinking about this too. You may not remember this. But we first met a long time ago at Cincinnati Gardens. You were with Dutch. Yes, yeah, I do remember. Yes, yeah. At the time, and he introduced. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk or anybody. He introduced us, and that was you were just getting started with the company at that time, weren't you? I was. Yeah, Jerry's the one that hired me. Uh, Jerry's the one that hired me. Jerry hired you. Dutch. Yeah, and uh, I love Dutch. I mean, I love Dutch. Dutch. Oh yeah, I do too. Such a smart, smart guy, funny guy. We traveled yeah, together. Yeah. He was he was probably the most entertaining guy I've ever been around. Uh, next yeah, to we, Jerry, of course. Yeah, he he was my color man on Cornette Smoky Mountain shows for a while. And then we talked about Ron's TV, uh, Dutch and the old shoot English shooter John Foley uh, worked a big. We worked a hell of a program Nelson Royal and I with them for the tag team titles here. But yeah, I love Dutch to death. He, and you're right, he's funny as hell. Oh, just naturally funny all the time. Yes. We would ride together and he would just make up stories, just literally make up stories going on the road. I, he entertained me for a year in a car. <laughs> and I loved every second. I still love talking to Dutch. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's good people. You're absolutely right. When did the bodybuilding stuff start? Well, you know, when I... Uh, when I moved back to Cincinnati in 85, uh, I got more serious in the, in the gym myself and then started working with a couple competitive young body, you know, not pros or anything, and uh, helping them train for a show. So I decided at age 47, I'm going to do one show. I just figured I should do one, right? So I can say I've done it so I know what I'm talking about, right? And 
greatest thing, I won my class that first show. So I got hooked, right? Seven years and, and 13 shows later, I decided that's enough. I was 54 years old. And then, and I, were I was you still winning? winning? Were you still winning last at that age? Huh? Were you still winning the contest? Oh, I, yeah, or placing anyway. I wouldn't, I wasn't using any juice. Well, they had they have age classes. Well, they had some. <laughs> <laughs> No, I uh, I did use some of our quality stuff to practice my posing routines to music, <laughs> but but I never used sauce. So at fifty four, you were still competing regularly in that. Well, I, yeah, I did. I was I, I did two shows a year, which uh, it, it take it like sixteen weeks to diet for for a show, right? To get get to where you want to be. But I'll tell you what, it's exhausting because it's twenty four seven. It's how you eat, how you sleep, your mental attitude, how you train, obviously. And then before a show, it's get car, you know, uh, getting rid of the carbs and then it's carving up and not too much. So they spill over just enough to fill out the muscle. It's, it's, uh, and then I got to work with the pros when I worked with uh, Perilla Performance. Work, well, actually, Animal and, and his, his wife was a competitive bodybuilder, uh, Joe Laurinaitis, his wife. And, uh, I got to work with some Linda Murray, who was eight times Miss Olympia, sure. and Ron Love, and that was a lot of fun working with the pro bodybuilders too. A lot of fun, but yeah, I, I'm still in the gym, minimum of three days a week. I prefer to be five, but I'm helping my son with his business now, and uh, that he sells uh, storage units, storage sheds, dog houses, dog tunnels, and stuff like that. And so I'm helping him out five days a week now. So I don't get in the gym as often as I'd like. I still like to be in the wrestling business. I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't want to take any bumps, but I'm still, I, my mind's still good. I can train. I can teach. Ask Nigel. You can, you can teach, right? Yes, you can. In fact, he told his son, if you get a chance to work, let's do so. I thought, damn, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'm proud. Listen. It ain't bragging if you can back it up. And Adam Cole, Tim Thatcher, Drew Gulak, Del, uh, Nigel McGinnis, those are some guys that uh, would, would give me credit, I think. Sure. And Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom listens to me once in a while, too. <laughs> Not often, but once in a while. Dr. Well, Tom know. is the best, and as good a person as he is, he's that bad of a driver of a car. Oh, I, you're he's telling me. Driver, he's the worst driver in, in the history of the automobile. On any planet, he's the worst driver in history. I have not been I in a car Tom. with him. I had not been in a car with him in so long. And then last last year, we I rode to Marietta, Georgia. We went down to Brad Armstrong's uh, grave uh, to, uh, on his the anniversary. I didn't know Tom had been going down there the last couple of years. And when I found that out, I, I said, can I go? He said, sure. And he drove. <laughs> I thought I may end up staying in this graveyard. <laughs> Big Glenn Jacobs rode with him one time, one time, and, and never get in the car with him again. That's how bad of a driver Tom is. The best guy on the planet. I love Tom, but he is. Oh, I do too. I do too. <laughs> and he would tell well we worked together and trained he'd say now Les got a short fuse but i'm calm and he'd be the first guy to scream you son of a bitch <laughs> i said boy that fuse got short all of a sudden <laughs> Les, what was the, the bodybuilding just fed mind me going back for a second what was the what did you learn something in particular that you didn't know before because all of us trained but you did it on a different level for a competition. You had to oh, go through yeah. the carbo load, yeah. the carbo depletion, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Did you, did you learn a couple the, of important things that you didn't know before? Oh, well, I learned one thing for sure that carbohydrates are addictive. Because when I'm trying to when start, first started trying to lean out, I was jonesing for carbs, right? And until my body made the adjustment. But, you know, when you're, uh, my, I never had a great metabolism to start with, but uh, so to get off potatoes, rice, bread, stuff like that, your body misses the carbs. But uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a science, it, it honestly is. 
and you can you can do all the hard work. I mentioned 16 weeks, but if you're too smooth when you step on that stage or too flat, you're you're out of the competition before it starts, you know. But yeah, it's uh, it's a science. It it is a science. And was there anything about the lifting that you found that was different than what you had done before as compared to the guys normally well, lifting? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't so much about how much can you lift. It's just getting keeping the muscles stimulated and, and some growth, right? But it yeah. wasn't what's your single, what's your best single? I don't know. Because it didn't matter. You know, you weren't power lifting, so it didn't, you know, and you step on a stage, they didn't know if you could lift five pounds or 50,000 pounds, right? And honestly, when you step on that stage you're probably the weakest you've been in 16 weeks because you've dieted down so much right and, and you've been depleted carbs and you're just carb loading again and honestly to go out there and pose for 90 seconds and to flex hard on every body every muscle that'll wear your ass out it really will yeah i, I saw photos of you you know knowing you you know when you were bulky and you were in a ring you, you, all of us try to have a little flesh on it so that that ring isn't so hard when you land. Sure. But then I saw you how you were cut down. Like I just couldn't believe that was less thatcher than I was doing <laughs> like that. And holy cow, what did you do? But you know, I'd seen it in Ricky Seymour. I see Ricky come in at 240, you know, and and and, and mid Atlantic sure. there working his ass off. And see him a month, six or two, six weeks later, two months later, he's down about uh, 195 and just ripped and cut and all that flesh is gone. I did. How the hell do you guys do that stuff? It's Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, Kevin Sullivan's a good one. Bodybuilding too. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin was a strong sucker. We videoed him here uh, squatting 400 pounds 25 times. Wow. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> right. Yes. That's why I said. <laughs> wow, is right. Some of those guys are just beasts and everything. I, 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 but you know, a lot of a lot of that is is your the way your joints are put together. Right. I mean, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Cone or back. Uh, it's been 20, 30 years ago. This guy Cone was a big Ed power. Cone. Ed Cone. Yeah, yeah. World and man. Uh, he went to. Uh, uh, like the Mayo Clinic or something, they did test, right? To find, how could he be this strong? And the only thing that they found that probably accounted for that was everything, all his joints and everything were perfectly shaped, Wow! right? It wasn't that they were any bigger than yours or mine or, you know, or than it should be, but everything was perfectly shaped and hooked together. So well, he was just a genetic, he was about. genetic freak, in other words. Like, yeah, yeah. But you stop and think about that, that's like that's like Hodge and, and his grip, you know. Hodge Hodge and yeah. they did studies on him and they, they found basically the same thing. He was double sure. tendon and some of us some of us tendons and others were just perfect shape and size for what yeah. he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a fact. Yes. Uh it's uh Sullivan was stocky to begin with but you know to be able to do i i said you really want to take video this so well if it don't work we throw it out right i said yeah but yeah i wish i still had that i wish i had a lot of that video but you know back then uh I, ronald would tell you the same thing today he wishes he had a lot of it too but uh everything was on two inch tape and nobody wanted to spend that money right they use them tapes over and over and over and over. But that, that's, that's another thing. It's, it's a shame because all those tapes were bicycle back then. So much of our history is, is, yes. is covered up on, on with other tape. That tape Absolutely. Is Absolutely. Yeah. A, lot of that happened, here. a lot of that happened to the uh, Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Is that right? They lost a lot of it because they re they taped over a lot of stuff. You know, it's now, you, now you know, people give anything to have all those old Johnny Carson tapes back, like he would the old wrestling tapes. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, when cassettes first came out, uh, if we were sending an, uh, an interview to Atlanta uh, for Slater or somebody, it couldn't be on a cassette. Turner, when the cassettes first came out, they were not quality enough, and Ted Turner wouldn't allow them to be aired on his station. So they, they've come a long way too. But uh, yeah, I... I wish we just, we had so many, we did, we took Garvin up in his, we had uh, a guy take, go up in the plane with Garvin and him doing some fancy stuff and filming that and, and, you know, all that stuff. I wish we had all that stuff now too, but 
when uh, when Cornette and I did the Night of Legends back in 94, uh, we were doing uh, video packages each week on the show leading up to that, right, about the history. In fact, on my Facebook page right now, uh, Joe Dombrowski posted, uh, I, I cover the uh, 50 years of history at Knoxville Wrestling. Uh, and I'm, I'm, doing, I'm on, out in Chilhowee Park, one of the places where we used to wrestle. But uh, yeah. That's only half your time there. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'm in pretty damn, pretty damn good shape for an old geezer, aren't I? Yeah, you are. We really are, Les. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry to cut you off there, but what, what, what was it, what Joe Dabras you say about you? <laughs> He's put that. Well, this video is up on my Facebook page now. That's I hadn't seen it in a long time either. You know, we I've got some stuff that would. I don't know. Uh, you know, I do a, a, a podcast on the Observer site. Uh, it's just video now. I mean, audio. But I'd love to go to video and and do what you guys are doing and show some of this stuff. You know that I've got. When we did the, the Night of Legends, that was in 94, and Dory, and, and T Dory Jr. and Terry were both here. And the next day, I took them in a studio, and we did a sit-down for an hour. We wow. had nothing to, nothing to sell, no matches to plug, just talking about their lives, growing up with their dad and all the guys who came, you know, through, through Amarillo and their, you know, we just, and it's, it's, it's been unedited. I don't want to edit it now because... The time Please tell me you still got that thing. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. And and what was what the first part, uh, one of the guys is setting lights and stuff, but they were the, the cameras were on. And it's it's Terry not working, but just Terry being goofy Terry, yeah. right? I mean, just being himself. And that's what I like about it so much, right? It's not again, he's not plugging a match or 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 doing a promo. It's just we're talking, right? And he's picking at me and I'm picking at him. And, and it was, uh, yeah, I'd love to use that stuff at, at some point in time, you know? And well, uh, maybe, maybe John and I can figure out a, a vehicle for you to use it. You're a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> I know. I've, got, <laughs> I've got a good co-host, uh, Vic Sosa. Uh, you, I don't know, you, you didn't meet him in Charlotte. He was in Charlotte for the last time we, we, we were there. Uh, Vic is a, a disc jockey on Clear Channel Station in New York City. And he's got that great voice, right? But he does, he records all our stuff and, and puts out. And uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I just say, I, I, I feel I have given to this business until I'm plumb near give out, but I've still got a lot. To, I've got a lot to give and I, I'd love to give, you know. I mean, and and you a, have the energy less to, to do it too. That, that's what's, what's amazing about you. You still have that same energy that you had 20 years ago, maybe not in a ring, but you know, in person. No, yeah, you know, I love the, yes. You still got that same passion up here in your yes, head. Yes, you I do. You're right. Well, you know what? It's who I am. It's what I've done for 62 years and going and counting. Right. Well, you're, you're like John. John and I started this stuff just to entertain you because it's pandemic driven. You know, we didn't have anything to do. Sure. Everybody's locked at home. He called me one day. Hey, let's, you know, you tell stories. I tell stories. Let's, let's tell them together and see what we can come up with. So you know, that's basically how we started. And you, you got that same energy that we do, that same passion to share yeah. you know, stories. Because our wrestling business is so historical and it, it gets it gets glossed over so easy with this modern day stuff. And there ain't anything wrong with the modern day stuff. It's just, but we had a history that helped help start this business. Oh, I know. And it should be it should be out there. People like you and me and John share it with everybody out there. Oh, I can find several things wrong. You got another hour and a half. I can tell you <laughs> several things wrong with the current business. How about a volume two? <laughs> <laughs> and it take, take us another year, John, to get a volume two out of you. Long. You don't have That's to. Right. But you know what? It's like the sixty-two years in the business for me. I loved it. I mean. When people say I wouldn't have done a thing different, hell, I can think of a thousand things I might have done different. Right? <laughs> I, I know a few I've done. <laughs> yes, but the point is, I, I would have made that ride with you that one night. Where was it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've I've loved every minute. I mean, it's been my life, and it, how many people can say they've lived their dream, right? And uh, the only thing I missed, Buddy Rogers, was my childhood idol. 
And I've got a picture of me and Buddy. I was 12 years old. as a wow, wow. Mu music hall in Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah. And I never got to meet him in the business, ever. Really? No. Pants, no. And I always, I'd love to have just one match with him, right? And, uh, well, Ernie Roth. Uh, Ernie used to li live with Buddy and Buddy's wife in Columbus for a year, right? That's where Ernie learned a lot of his uh, ideas about the business. So uh, when he went to New York in the 70s to be uh, whatever the hell name he used up there, uh, the Grand right. Wizard, Grand Wizard. Uh, he, call, uh, he called me, he said, you want to work with Rogers? And I said, what are you talking about? Uh, he said, well, he's, in, he's working in territory up here. If you want to come up, I, I'll see that you work with him. But I was doing well in, in Charlotte. I didn't want to, you know, didn't want to give up the money. And, and I realized I wasn't big enough to be on top in New York at that time. That was Bruno and uh, Stasiak and, you know, all the giants, man. It was wasn't a place for for a uh, junior heavyweight, but uh, yeah, he says I'll 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 get you, I'll be sure you work with him, and that's the only thing I wish I'd had a chance to lock up with Buddy Rogers. You know, I never got to work against him, but I mean, I shared a ring with him. We all have those guys that as we're coming up, we we would like to share the ring with. He was one of them. There's a picture out I saw not long ago me standing in a ring with Buddy, and I kind of got, got that look, and I started trying to flash back to that time that we were in Miami, and I was his tag team partner, and they'd introduced me, and they were introducing Buddy, and the crowd, you know, it's basically a New York crowd in Miami, ever, Buddy, 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 and I'm just, I'm just really marking out, and I'm, I'm looking out on the corner of my eye, and there's a smile on my face. I'm marking out just like the marker. Here I am in the ring with Buddy Rogers. Yeah. What the hell is going on? It was that kind of thrill for me. You know, I, I used the Rogers O'Connor match from 61 at Comiskey Park as a that's training. What John, that's one John and I talk about all the time. We try, to get, we try to get guys to copy a lot of that stuff. Man. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, where, where Pat does the spinning arm, where oh, it looks like he's taking yeah. out. And every time I show that, there'll be two or three kids say, oh, man, that's really cool. I said, use it, but they won't. They won't, yeah. They same, here, same here, same here. I've been, over in, I've been over NXT, and I asked, did you guys show it? Oh, yeah, we show it on video all the time, but guys just, they think it's a rest hold, you know? It's unbelievable. It is. You're right. There's so much to learn. I'll tell you another, you guys would like, enjoy watching this. This is from Gunkel's promotion in 73 Atlanta, Dickie Steinborn and Tommy Sigler in a babyface match. Yeah. And they're telling us a hell of a story, right? Going back to the same holds, you know, and, and run a spot, going back. And I had one kid, I showed it one time, and he said, but they keep going back to the same hold. <laughs> I said, really, you think? Duh, 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 I, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's the current generation we're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why would he not go back to the same hold? He didn't die. Oh, well, hell, we can't talk to him then. <laughs> That's my problem with the business today is everything is, it's too much of everything. And when I mean that, well, you know, I'll say, when I do clinics, I'll say to the guys, how many guys here uh, have wives or living girlfriends? And the guys raise their hand. I said, okay, I got, a, I got homework for you tonight before you come in the bar, okay? When you get home and you and your wife get in bed, say, honey, we're going to make love tonight. Now I'm going to stroke your breast and you moan and then you reach over and see you guys are starting to smile and the kids don't they don't want, think that old man think i'm like i said it's okay i meant it to be funny but i'm making a point and here's my point you know that your wife first of all you wouldn't do it she'd throw your ass out of bed but the other point is you wouldn't do it because you know her likes her dislikes which you know her favorite color and all that but you would never try this with her but yet on Saturday night, you and your opponent are going to sit in a dressing room someplace where there's 500 people, and you're going to lay a match out in the back for people you've never seen before in your friggin' life. So why are you doing that? Of course, they don't have an answer because there is no reason to do that. Because if those people aren't buying what you're selling, how do you switch gears if you don't know how? Right? And exactly. I'll tell you what, one of my other heroes in the business was Garibaldi. Leo, Leo Garibaldi. 
one of the sharpest minds I've ever talked to. Amen. Amen. Yeah. First, first night work in uh, the old land auditorium. Kirby and I went against this this young this team I'd never met before. Kirby may have worked with him. And Leo comes in and says, uh, "These guys are going to be my top heels here for quite some time, and I need you guys to get them over, if you don't mind." Okay, so I'm whatever, right? We're just let's work. So anyway, he's the referee. Leo refereed a lot of the matches, so he's a referee on our match. And it was one of those nights. We couldn't have made a mistake if we had to try, right? Your feet don't touch the ground. And, and the people at, at that old auditorium just rock. In the middle of the match, Leo comes around and says, we're not wasting this. We're bringing it back. Here's the new finish. Hmm. And none of us missed a beat. How many kids today could say that, right? We switched gears in the middle of the match and went on and came or to return and came back the next week. I loved when Leo would referee the matches because if some, if something was going wrong, he would he would he would start and John he would start making suggestions. You didn't have to listen to him, but if you follow him, all of a sudden that match that was just down here, all of a sudden you started hearing a roar. Yeah. And he would he would help you. He would he would be there calling the matches for you and helping you build to that spot yes. there. And before you knew it, you'd, wow, the people are going crazy. Well, you know when he's laying a, a like a finish out in the dressing room. He would, his passion would come out. And then I want him, you to him and Louis, yes. to, him and Louis to let it expended more energy, given a finish than anybody I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Leo was a hell of a baby face too. Yeah. Yeah. He drew I, a big see, I'm old enough LA, to remember right? watching but him and his dad were a team in LA. Yeah. And Leo was on fire when they got, and he was what 17, 18 years old at that time too. I think. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Unbelievable. Leo, Leo was a class guy too. I, I, I really thought the world of Leo. I did too. I did too. He, uh, he took me under his, when I went to Atlanta in 73, right? You know what he told, he took the first day, he said, we're going, let's go to lunch. And he said, you know, the guy that started this war is going to end up booking the NWA office. I just looked, he said, mark my words. And he was right. Ernesto. Ended up booking the, the NWA territory. Right. But I'll tell you what, working in that office with Leo and Watts coming in, they butt heads sometimes, but there's two great minds, right? And I said, but Leo instilled confidence too. He, uh, yeah, he, he could. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. He Risk would build you up. I mean, he, that, that's Leo could get on your ass, chew you up, but at the same time, he's building you up. At the same yes. Time. Well, he wanted, he said, I need you. To go to this uh, one small town, Saturday night town. Uh, Jerry Oates was wrestling Billy Spears. It was a return, and I forget what the match was, but I was going to be a special referee. He said, So I, you know, he gave me the finish for the match. And he said, Then uh, I said, What about the other matches? He said, How long have you been in this business? At the time, about 13 years. You don't know any finishes? Oh, I, yeah. He said, That's why I'm sending you. And that's all. And I said, Damn, get your ass up there, Les. <laughs> Make sure you get this right. But yeah, he instilled that kind of confidence in them. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, hiding uh, Paul Jones's car. We pulled a stunt on Jack. The first time I worked Atlanta TV with Gordon was the Saturday. I After know what Jack you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, won the, Jack won the title on Friday night in Houston. Listen to this, John. It's all all, all time classic on my brother Jack. So Jack Jack comes. He flies in. Right, we have him on the show and interview him at new champion and everything. So we're show's over and he stops to talk to Gordon and I in the hallway, and he's telling. He said, "I'm nervous about this belt. Why? Well, it's, it's uh, they haven't got it insured yet." He said, "I, I just." It, makes me nervous oh okay so anyway he had set the box the belt in down on the floor they and had a special box they had a special yeah the hand, yeah and uh so somebody down the hall said hey jack and he said i'll be right back and he went and left the box sitting there right gordon looks at me and he looks down i i know what he's I said, yeah so there was an office door right there and it, it's unlocked so pulls the door open sticks the belt in shuts the door and we go back to talking to each other. Jack comes back to say, "Is why well, I, I got to get to the air. <laughs> Where's the bell? Gordon says, 
What do you mean, where's the belt? Well, the belt, it was, I don't know. You, you see the color drained out of his face, right? Mr. Muchnick, that new uh, belt, I just uh, lost it. <laughs> Yeah, he was good. I remember he called me that, that afternoon and told me about that. Uh, the first time with the belt, he lost the belt. <laughs> what? What are you like? Who'd you who beat you? He said, No, I lost it. I physically lost it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, poor Jack. I mean, uh, he, he would rib, he wasn't ribbed much, but when they, when they would rib him, it was classic rib, like when he met the governor of Texas, you know, and they said that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, last man, we really appreciate you. It's getting late here, and I know you're old, and you need to get your beauty. <laughs> a lot of it, too. So. Gerald, Gerald's getting ready to have another seizure, and so he right. was. How, how do you like it? My internet has stayed on since I I repaired it. Yeah. <laughs> well, my question is this: When are we gonna do it again? Well, it, it takes a year to get you booked, but uh, we'll, well, we'll, now we'll, that I know how. <laughs> we'll start planning now and we'll have a volume to an episode. I really, I've enjoyed myself. I have you guys. Uh, but do you have any more stories? Oh, I've, how many years you have any stories you want? <laughs> People keep saying, why don't you write a book? Nobody, nobody will sit down and talk to me that long to write a book. <laughs> or or uh, somebody had asked JR about working with me. He said, and I guess they had said, do you listen to him or something? And he said, hey, man, tell me stories about Buddy Rogers I listened to. <laughs> he said, I'm, but I was a kid then, too, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you were a kid for a long time. You were just a I'm still kid. a kid. John, I'll tell you a story that, that's not very well known. But one time, Eddie Graham, was when he last kind of brought it up, and I thought he was going there. When Gordon first started doing Atlanta TV, you know, he'd go on every weekend. Every weekend he was gone. Well, they didn't want things done. You know, Gordon was his go-to guy. So he got he got a little upset with Gordon because Gordon was blowing up all across the country. You know, and he was people were calling wanting Gordon to come and guest host here. So Eddie said, I'm gonna get me a new guy. He said, Who you? I said, Well, Les Thatcher. He said, Call him, tell him come down here. I got I got a plan. So I called Les. I told Les that Les was Les was great. Les was scared to death. He did not want it. Yeah, no, wait a minute. I did, they didn't tell me what I was coming. All they know me, I was coming down to sit in with Gordon. You right? sat in with Gordon, yeah. Yes, so yeah, I did. So, so okay, and well, go ahead. You can tell them better than I can. All right. Well, and then after everybody had left and Gordon had left, there was Kevin Sullivan, Dusty, Eddie, Mike Graham, and and Briscoe. We're all they're all in the office, and now they're saying, "Hey." They're going, they, I don't know why Eddie got mad at Gordon, but he wanted to fire him, oh. and we want to offer you the spot. Whoa. You know? And <clears throat> Mike even said, you know, Les, uh, I've got a nice condo. I'll let, you, I'll let you live in the condo. I mean, that's how bad they wanted to change things around, right? So, you know, I, somebody's going to take this spot, right? And I figure, why not? You know, at the time I was freelancing, I wasn't doing anything steady. But here's now he can tell you what happened after I went back. I, I flew back in here. And so they can't decide. Eddie says, well, who's going well, to here, 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 here what happened? Eddie come to me and he said, you got to fire Gordon. I look at Eddie. Like, <laughs> I got to fire Gordon. So no thing it is. No. You're a stockholder. You're, you, you, it's your duty. You, you got to fire him. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, giving you what we want done as, as a company, and you being a, a stockholder company, it's your responsibility to tell him. And so I, 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 I go home. You know, we got a couple of days before this happens, and you know, I'm calling. And Gordon, Gordon's not no dummy. Gordon, Gordon, you know, he's feeling stuff going on. So he, he right. called me and he said. Briscoe, he says, I've known you long. What's going on? And I said, hey, Gordon, I don't know. I don't know what Eddie's doing. He said, well, Eddie's got something in mind. Eddie don't do this. It just, you know, uh, treat treat me like this. Less stuff. I said, well, I do know he's hot at you about Atlanta and all that stuff. He said, well, I had Barnett straighten all that stuff out with him. Well, I didn't know about that. So I started thinking, I said, man, it's not my responsibility. Here I, you know, I'm 
twelve percent owner of this company. You know, Eddie owns owns the majority of it. It's not my job to fire a guy like Gordon. So, <laughs> so I I I man up and I and I, I call Gord. I call uh, call Eddie and I said Eddie. I said you know I've really been thinking, putting a lot of thought in this. I said I just don't feel it's my 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 obligation to, to tell Gordon that that he's being replaced. I said if anybody's got to fire Gordon, it's got to be you because I'm I'm not doing. It. And I'm sorry, I'm just not doing it. And I hung up the phone. And of course, Eddie didn't have to have the have them either to, to go. <laughs> Can so you believe Eddie, this? These two old tough shooters, and they couldn't fire a guy who. That's right. The fire damn legend, man. No way. <laughs> you know? And hire a legend. No, that's what that's what Eddie said. You're hiring a you're hiring a future legend. And so. Well, I, now I'll tell you how, because I I didn't mention, but this goes back to seventy three, seventy four. Uh, when I went in down there, the idea was for Gordon, you know, to phase him out. And Leo had figured, well, I won the first two ring battle wall there in Atlanta. And Leo had figured me and Bobby Shane to work a big program around territory to kick things off too. So anyway, Barnett bought in, right? And, uh, but before he came in, Leo and, and uh, uh, Bill Watts called me in the office and said, and they said well, we think maybe it's time to, you know, let Gordon stay in, in Tampa. And I said, let me run something by you guys. But I said, since I've been here, one of the things we've been talking about, everybody mentions, we want to look as much like the Hawks or the Braves, you know, as the Falcons as they do, right? And I said, they use a play-by-play -play and a color guy. And of course, wrestling up until then had basically been a one show, you know, on the mic. And they said, yeah, that does sense. So we let, let's keep him. I said, yeah, I think that's, you know. So that was, I thought everything was good. So then Barnett bought in. So Barnett calls me in the office uh, a couple months into 74 and said, you know, Leslie. I gave you the name Thatcher. I said, yeah, I didn't know where we were going with this, but yeah, Jim, sure. Well, you know, Leslie, I want to buy into Florida. So I've got to kiss Eddie's ass. And to do that, I need to let Gordon be the star here. And besides that, I can't afford two commentators because I have my chauffeur in my <laughs> penthouse. I thought, yeah, have Jim, I have my Rolls Royce. I wouldn't want you to give up the Rolls Royce and the penthouse, you know, God forbid you do that. <laughs> and he said, so, and I've already called George Scott and Jimmy Crockett and they would love to have you back or you can go somewhere, any place you'd like. And I said, I'll go to Charlotte. Thank you very much, Jim. So that I shot myself out of a job there because if I let Gordon go when they, they but I was, I think, I still think I was right because the two man team, Made a better appearance, I thought, than you know, just uh, the one guy. So TV was changing there, and you saw the changes come along, and you were ahead of the curve there. Uh, it, yeah, it took. It always takes wrestling so long. At least it used to take when the old territory days. It took us so long to to buy into the change that was coming along because everything had worked. It was always status quo is working. Why change anything? Right. Well, it's, it goes back to the T-shirts, right? The, the promoters, they never sold T-shirts before, so they weren't interested in selling them then. So, yeah. All right. Well, I, you, since you're going to kick me off here, the only thing when, hey, when Les, we come, Les, when we come so back. For coming on. I, I, really, I really look forward to this for a long time. And it's, it's been such a treat having you. I'd love to have you back. Uh, maybe we can just go I'm, on the prints and it'll just be us two. I, yeah, I'd, I'd love if we can keep Gerald from having the St. Vitus dance <laughs> twitching all the time, right? But yeah, I want one of those BWO two uh, B B two W O T shirts. Do you know what that stands for? Uh, Frisco and no, I don't. What? I can't tell you. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> Well, it's B, put it's me B, out of my it's, B, it's B squared, dumbass. Come on, you hillbilly. It's B squared. Oh, I, <laughs> I born. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I don't know. I know. I have to read. I called you that. Booner. <laughs> right. Well, Kentucky hillbillies. The Dust Bowl. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, last thank you. Uh, John, 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 John's got to go to the bathroom, I think. <laughs> no, I don't.